Welcome back to episode 42 of Chatting with Nuts. I am, of course, too sweet to be sour. I am the booktube beefcake. I am the Friday night delight, and I am full of pumpkin pie. I am Jimmy Nuts, and I am accompanied by my great friend, who I feel like I haven't talked to in forever, <laughs> Sarah from Sarah Reads. How are you? I am well, thank you. It's only because I haven't talked to anyone in forever because I feel like my germ-ridden children just keep cycling different illnesses through my house. So it just <laughs> means that I am permanently either taking care of someone who's sick or sick myself. So, so you're just always developing new super variants and and mm -hmm. never. Exactly. But, but but you still seem to read a ton. Like your month this month, I've been following you on Instagram, is insane. I don't know where it's coming from. You you have the stamina of a thousand readers. Um, and I watched your video whenever you were kind of talking about what you're going to be reading in November. So I've, I've been kind of keeping track, but there's something that you're a part of that I have no idea what it is. And I've been on booktube for almost three years. I do, you know, book hauls, TBRs, tags. I get all that stuff. What can, can you just break this down for me? Like what is, and for probably people watching too, what is a readathon? Right. There's like points yeah. involved and there's a lot there of stuff are. going on. What is a yeah. readathon on booktube? So a readathon is how I got on booktube. So I, the very first readathon that I ever did was, I think it was called like the reindeer games. Alan was part of it actually. Um, <laughs> Alan is very mad at you right now. He says, Sarah, I've been trying to get you on a video for a month. I said to Alan, like, I feel like when I talk to Alan or Alan talks at me, I need to bring up receipts. Mm -hmm. I sent Alan a message and said, Alan, I have this full week where I'm not on call. We can schedule something. And he's all he wants. See, I think Alan needs to collect reasons to be angry with me because I'm actually such a good friend that he needs to make things up in order to yell about them. He does. He does dunk you at least every time he's on at least once. You know, he's like, right? Sarah used to be my friend, but he, she doesn't read anything now. <laughs> it must be it must be a form of affection. That's all I can think. <laughs> that, is, that is when Alan creates a new reality around you in a conflict that doesn't exist. It's him showing <laughs> you that he loves you. Yes, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, I was in a readathon that Alan was a part of. Are you changing me into reading Lion of Macedon? Yeah, and I got to say, Alan does not seem pleased about this Lion of Macedon that he was tricked into reading by David Gemmel. I don't know what's going on there, but there's there's some heat. Oh, my God. Okay. I need So we need to talk about this. We can talk about readathons after. I'll yeah. explain what those are later. Yes. So I did, in fact trick Alan into reading the line of Macedon but in fairness I thought it was going to be amazing because I recently read the Troy trilogy which was amazing I loved it it was awesome I've read a couple things by David Gemmel have liked them all and then love the Troy trilogy so line of Macedon was also historical but like with a bit of magic so I thought it was going to be awesome and I actually was kind of enjoying it. I, w I was enjoying it. I gave four stars. So I'm waiting for Alan to say four stars, just like the Winter King, because I'm sure that's going to pop up there in a second. But <laughs> I gave it four stars. And, but Alan did make some really good points. So when he was reading it, he had this like historical background that I did not have. So the things that were happening in the book that the main character, Parmenian, was doing, I was like, these are really awesome. No wonder Alan likes Parmenian so much. He did a lot of cool stuff. And then I would get this like, diatribe from Alan that was like Parmenian did none of this in like all caps just like see here we go and so I, I don't think that Alan's bashing of the book is unreasonable based on the context that he has but I thought I was doing a good thing I thought I was doing a nice thing inviting him to read this book with me and it blew up in my face I guess you know, you try to do something nice for people, you know, and uh, it just never works out. It doesn't. I'm I'm only going to be mean from now on. <laughs> so Alan essentially just well actually the entire read along is yeah. what happened. Okay. He did, but it was very entertaining. So the main the main character does a lot of stuff that allegedly he didn't do. I don't know. Alan tells a lot of fibs. So maybe Parmenian <laughs> did do those things. And Alan is just trying to dupe me so that when we do a live show, I can say these things and then look like I have no idea what I'm talking about, which the more I think about it, that's probably true. I'm going to Google these things because I feel like I need to fact check Alan. But yes. um, <laughs> yeah, and, and, uh, <laughs> would you say that you're levying the accusation that Alan from Library of Alexandria is a liar? I would, I would say that I tried to word it okay. a little more gently as I tend to do, but 
that is in fact what I was saying. You really got down to it. Yeah, what I mean, it, history better. Thank you, Mitch. What yeah, is wrong with that? George Martin's a big, uh, you know, he's a big supporter of this, and he said, you know, if I wrote history more boring, that would be that'd be terrible. So yeah, I turned it up to ten, and maybe that's what Gemma was doing. Yeah. Though I am uh, a fellow non-believer in uh, in the Gemma. Uh, the Gemmel crew, I guess. Uh, I, I read Legend and well, I tried to read Legend and I, I didn't love it. But I'm going to get back to it. And I know you like the Troy series. And I think Alan didn't read the Troy series. This is his first Gemmel. He did not. This was his first Gemmel. And so reading Legend, which I did like, but I <laughs> I liked it in like the classic 80s fantasy. Like you have to expect certain things out of something that was written in that time period mm -hmm. and is heroic fantasy. So yeah. I liked it for, you know, the reasons that I, <laughs> I like that. But if you compare Legend to the Troy trilogy, I think there's a vast difference. Like one is his first book and the other is his last series. So I think yeah. that he did grow a lot as an author. But Yeah. And there's a lot of stuff about Legend that that. I should have loved, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm definitely willing to give him a uh, another shot. Maybe Lion of Macedon. Maybe that won't. I don't have any historical context, though, because I'm a dummy. You, um, you know, but my, my education did not include history, I think. Uh, I remember some pieces of the Civil War, but that's about it. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe I could also enjoy it. I, I was most intrigued by Troy, though. Like when I first looked at Gem Gemmel, like everything you've written, I said, man, that Troy trilogy sounds awesome. And his wife finished that, right? She did. Yeah. How cool is that? I mean, actually, it's extremely sad because he passed away. Yes. Um, so maybe cool is not the word for it, but I'm glad that she was able to finish it up. And it seems like people uh, thought she did a really nice job. So, yes, I think you know, she understood his style really well. You can I think you can tell that someone different put it together. But I don't know if I didn't know that, if I would have noticed it. It's kind of like when you know that Joe Hill is Stephen King's son and then you read his books and you're like, of course you're Stephen King's son. This sounds just like him. But then I'm like, if I didn't know that, would I put put those two things together? Yeah, yeah. There's definitely like, I mean, that's always affecting us because that's that's kind of the byproduct of being online and, and having a booktube channel even, right? Like, I think it's absolutely affected my uh, Dresden read a bit. Yeah. Just, you know, everyone telling, oh, this is the book. This is the book. So I feel like my expectations get a little too high. Um, or maybe even there's a piece of me that's, you know, saying, hey, can it really be this? Good? You know what I mean? Like you're kind of bucking back against it, even if you don't really want to. Mm -hmm. um, I got my dad to read Dresden. I, I gave him. What book is he on? So, he, so I gave him book one. He went out and bought book two and three before I could nice. give it to him. And he finished up Great Peril. And I said, well, what do you think? And he said, well. I can tell you one thing, that butcher guy's a pervert. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best reaction. What a dad reaction. And, and my dad is not politically correct. I mean, you know, he, but, you know, we used to watch Freddy Krueger when I was five. You know, we, we were pretty loose. But yeah, he's like, I'm going to tell you what, that guy, they're pretty good. But man, he is a pervert. <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah, he is. <laughs> that is awesome. Like, especially Great Peril. <laughs> Yeah, great peril for sure. My dad had that reaction after book eight. Have you, where are you right now? So I, uh, I actually listened to Deadbeat on the way to home and back from home. Uh, so I have about two hours left in the audio book, uh, maybe like a hundred and some pages left, um, some, somewhere around there. And I think I like Deadbeat just as much as I did Summer Night and Death Mass, but obviously the ending could be like crazy. Um, but which is good because I, I like it a lot more in Blood Rights because I thought mm -hmm. Blood Rights was just like meh. Right. So. Um, it's still not to that level, you know, still, that I keep still not, you haven't still hit. not there. I, it's one of those things where I, I kind of feel right. this way about the expanse where it's like, it's good. Mm -hmm. And when I'm in the mood for it, it's the only thing that will fill that void. Um, like the expanse for me, like, I know it's sci-fi, but like, I don't necessarily go to the expanse. When I'm in a sci-fi mood. I go to the expanse when I'm in an expanse mood. And that's kind of the same thing with Dresden. Like there's times where I'm like, Oh, kind of want to hear Harry talk and say hell's bells for the eighth million time you know <laughs> um so it's just one of those things where like yeah polka will never die that i there's a lot of relationships and a new character that i really like in deadbeat so th there's definitely some positives there but um it's just one of those things where it's not ever sweeping me away and i'm not like dying to get to the next one so much as it is that i'm like okay it's time for another one of these and that's kind of how i am with the expanse as well so it's not a bad thing um i'm just hoping that i feel the stakes at some point um 
but yeah, my dad, and I know your dad, like you, you and your dad read together. Right. And you guys share recommends and all that stuff. And uh, I thought of you actually, whenever, cause we've talked about Dresden before. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, my dad is, is turned into a pretty big reader and it, uh, it warms my heart. I love it. Um, he, he read some King. He read elevation. He said it wasn't very good. Uh, I thought that was funny because he's always like King. <laughs> yeah, he, he read Elevation. He gave it to me. I haven't read it yet. And he gave it to me. He's like, you'll probably read this in a day. It's not very good, though. <laughs> and then he, I gave him Assassin's Apprentice. And I was I didn't know. I didn't know what to expect. And he told me that he thinks Robin Hobb is his new favorite author. He said that he he's like, that book was just amazing. And I was like, yeah, I mean, you know, it's not a book that I was confident he would like, but I wanted him to try it. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he had him coming back and being like, is there any more of those? Like, I'd like to read other stuff from her. And I'm like, Oh, perfect. So I'm going to give them all uh, the rest of the trilogy and the illustrated editions and for Christmas, he knows. So it's not a surprise if he's watching. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. So that's kind of cool. And uh, you know, he confirmed, yeah, Jim Butcher is a pervert. Uh, so <laughs> Dad confirmed. Dad confirmed. <laughs> I see you've been doing some Dresden talks uh, with, is it J.R. Carroll and Alex, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. How, how are those going? You guys are like on book 10 and 11 already, though. They're fun, but it's really hard to go back and talk about the previous books because my experience with Dresden, Dresden did change significantly where I did not really care that much. And then I liked it more and then I was all in and so being where I am right now which is all in and trying to go back and talk about books where I was not as emotionally invested I have to keep like saying things about characters that I now love and <laughs> it's really hard <laughs> it's hard to go and retrospectively talk about something yeah it is really hard to retroactively go by especially like whenever there's you know maybe a criticism levied or something and you're like oh that's addressed in this book but I can't say that mm -hmm. um I did the Prince of Nothing uh, for our Scott Baker. I was doing that with Joanna Raff mm -hmm. and Philip mm -hmm. and they're having, you know, some questions and stuff. And I'm like, I really can't answer a lot of this stuff because like it kind of gives it away. Um, and that can be a little frustrating, not frustrating, but it can be hard and just tough not to spoil people. And I can only imagine it's probably hard to talk about like full full moon, right? Like I can't imagine fool's moon is like exciting to talk about after you've read the later Dresden stuff, right? Exactly. And you don't want, or I don't want what I probably shouldn't care about, but do kind of just wait till changes <laughs> is saying things because I'm trying to say things as yes. the Sarah of reading full moon. And I don't want people to come in and like watch it or people who love Dresden who are like, you know, she, she is totally wrong about this or she doesn't care about Dresden or she doesn't whatever Dresden. And so I'm just, I'm trying to be appropriate to the time of the books that we are in also trying to encompass all of the love that i have for the series yes it's very hard to reconcile those two yes two and things. it's and it is fun because sometimes people bring up something that you missed or there's a criticism so it's always fun like kind of backtracking on, on series but it can definitely be um a bit difficult andrews wizardly reads says i got warned off r scott baker by joanna i would uh absolutely think andrew that you would not enjoy r scott baker yeah. Uh, one of the harder things to recommend for sure. Um, Sarah, I think you could. Yeah, I think you could. I would love to chat with you about it. I think that you would have a really interesting perspective on it. Um, and it's on yeah, I know. I it's like a million things, but I, you know, I saw you post in a video, like I said about the this readathon. Mm -hmm. So you, you got to break this down for after we got derailed by Alan, of course. That's but true. Let, let's find out what readathons. Yes. <laughs> We had to. He always steals the show, even when he's not on. So explain this to me. So what a readathon is basically is something that is organized. Someone will organize a team reading event. And depending on who's running it, they function a little bit differently. So like I said, I came into BookTube initially after a readathon. So it was hosted by the Shelf Space Discord, which was one that Alan's part of. He, he does the like book monthly book club discussions sometimes with them. So they hosted one at Christmas of... 2020 and their readathon was that there were like that was a, a big one that one was an intense one that's when i read um the stand in two days because i was trying to get as many points as i possibly could by reading like so many pages in a row um but that one had like i don't know 16 prompts or something and it you got more points based on your word count 
that was my highest reading month ever. I think I read like 8,000 words or something. Like I just <laughs> kept to reading and reading every day. Um, but basically there's a number of prompts You get points for different things and people are separated into teams. So it was fun back then because I got to meet some book two people in a more informal environment, get to know mm -hmm. some people become friends. And then you get that like team spirit up. Uh, the one that I'm doing right now was organized by a booktuber named Hannah and she had invited me to be one of the co-hosts for the readathon and she did an amazing job. So she made up the theme, the prompts, the graphics, like everything that I have been sharing, she made herself and it's all based around fairy tale retellings. So it's all of her prompts are related thematically to fairy tale retellings, but like a bunch of different things. <laughs> a bunch of different books can fit the prompts and basically you read them you submit your points and then you get bragging rights if you win at the end but it's, it's just a fun way to make friends in the booktube community because i think it can be really hard like some people are really yeah. lucky i was really lucky when i started that i met some great friends who like gave me a boost and did all those kinds mm -hmm. of things but for people who are maybe shy or don't know anybody yet it's a good way to become part of the community Oh yeah. And, and the community is, is fractured, right? I mean, there is the larger community, but we all have, you know, the people that we talk to and then every now and then you find new people to talk to and it's yeah. always fun and it's a good way to probably to it, you know, uh, align taste or maybe have some debates about things that you think are rather good or rather bad. Um, it is interesting that there are just like small, like there's uh, communities within communities, right? Like I have a network of people I talk to mm -hmm. and I like growing that, but it is tough. Um, and, and you could probably relate. I mean, the more you grow and the more things that you have to do on your channel and you're growing your own community, it is hard to get to know more people um, and, and reach out. You get comfortable with certain people. You can have really good conversations with them. I mean, that's why I have a lot of repeat guests on this show because there's only so much uh, mental bandwidth that I have uh, whenever I bring on people. And I like, I like catching back up. Like this is how me and you catch up. Exactly. Yeah. And this is same thing with Alan. Uh, <laughs> though I talk to Alan almost every day now. Um, but you know, at the time it was like, man, it's been like a month. I probably should see what Alan's up to. I know that he's mad about something. Like we got to bring happening. him on. It's, it's nice that Alan talks to you every day. He doesn't talk to me. He only yells at me. And even that is, you know, bi-weekly. <laughs> There's always there's always a bone to pick with you, apparently, mm -hmm. from Alan's side of things. Um, well, this readathon thing is uh, wild, and I can't believe that I had never heard about it in three years uh, of BookTube. Uh, apparently, I am still blind to some of the uh, the ongoings. Oh, uh, here, Derry says, "Wait a minute, Jimmy. Does that mean if I stop chatting with you on Discord, I'd get an invite? That is that is not what that means." <laughs> That's not, I'm not trying to say that, but I'm just saying there's people I enjoy talking to. And then once you have that network, you know, it's, it is a lot of fun. Um, you're doing a pretty great job, uh, over at your channel with the readathon. And I know that you have a, you have a weekly or a weekly, oh my God, a monthly like channel read along. And this month's was justice of Kings by Richard Swan, which is a book that I was very, very excited about when it came out. And book two, I believe is slated sometime next year. If I'm not mistaken, yeah, it has an awesome cover. Yeah, I thought the cover looked dope. And he said that he was going to put a recap for book one on his website, which is really nice. Won't be in the book, but if you need a refresher, you can do uh, the website synopsis, which is great because I held off on reading book one because I said, well, I want to see a couple more books out and then I'll just read through of them. Um, was that at all a part of the decision whenever you decided to pick up Justice, for, uh, Justice of Kings? Just because I want to prove to everyone what a good friend I am to Alan. I actually was trying to decide on a new book I was going to read this year. So I went to my good friend, Alan, and said, Alan, I would like to read one of the books that you really enjoyed. What do you think I would like better, Justice of Kings or Age of Ash? Because I also like Daniel Abraham. And he was like, I think you'll like both of them, but you should read Justice of Kings first. And I listen. So you're welcome, Alan. Yeah, I would say out of those two books, I've seen almost unanimous uh, enjoyment from justice of kings or it's it really is justice fun. am i saying it right is it justice of kings for some yeah. reason i want to say justice for kings i don't know why um and then age of ash seems to be the one that uh i have a feeling just me and alan are gonna like it like that's probably it's probably just gonna be <laughs> me him <laughs> yeah it might just be us uh because that we reminds like me i have not finished dagger in the coin i read the first dagger in the coin book so this is what happened this summer i started reading dagger and coin the first one right. penny and i were going to read them together and then penny went through a bit of a like fantasy slump so you know that i appreciate happens. that no blame for penny this i was still super invested in wanting to read them and i was reading 
Brian Lee Durfee's book at the same time. What's the mm. first one called? The Black Star? Is that the, the first forgetting one? Moon. No, Forgetting Moon. There we yeah. go. So I was reading Forgetting Moon and I started them both around the same time. And I loved the first Dagger and Coin book so much that I stopped Brian Lee Durfee's book, which I had been enjoying, but they were both like long epic fantasy and I wanted to do one or the other. And I loved it. And I went on vacation and I read it on the plane. It was so good. I haven't read the second one. I have no excuse. <sighs> Well, I want to read them so badly. They're so good. Yeah, and I believe you you liked book one. I think you're the only other person who like definitely loved book one, right? I did. I yeah, did. Be, because even Alan and Patrick, who enjoyed the series, uh, they kind of struggled with book one a little bit. But for me, I felt like I was I was an outsider because I was like, I, I just enjoyed it. Like, I never once had a moment where I was like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I was just in the whole way through yeah. it. Um, part of that is just because I think the characters, for some reason, felt really fresh to me. Um, yes. there's also some tropes in there that, that I happen to, uh, enjoy. And yeah, I, Alan, I know you liked book one, but I think you said that there was a part where you it was like a little slow and took a little time and then you got into it, but I, I've been kind of waiting for you to, to read more of them, Sarah. I'm not going to lie to you. I know because we said we were going to talk about them. I was like, I'm going to read them. Then me and Jimmy can have a series chat. And now you won't even remember them anymore by the time I get to the end of the series. I have extensive notes on those books. Oh, um, that's excellent. Which which is kind of weird because I did all these notes and I only did a review for book one. Um, it was just that I felt like I would have said the same things for each book, but just more. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Um, especially book three. Like, I think book three is awesome. It's still one of probably my favorite more favorite books i would say i don't know if it's like a top 10 book of all time but definitely the highlight of the series for me yeah. uh and then book five is great it's really really great um <laughs> alan would love to be in the chat we can have a chat alan all of us could have a chat yes and alan agrees book three is the best it has yeah. a wild ending that is very abrahamish i would say so uh, Long Price Quartet is on my need to read for 2023 and then Age of Ash I'll probably read at some point um, but it is interesting uh, Alan Alan championed that book and really pushed it put it out there and I was so excited me and him were talking about we're like mm -hmm. maybe this will be like the big Daniel Abraham fantasy series and it just seems like the reception to his book one for you know that series is the same as all of his other ones where people are kind of like you know eh. yeah. which is a shame I think it's a shame but it is, but it, it, I think it'll appeal to a certain subset of readers. I think Daniel Abraham will always have readership. It's just, I don't know how broad that readership will be. Yeah. And he, I don't think he's difficult to recommend because like, you'll know whether or not he's for you pretty quickly. Yes. Um, though yeah. I do wish people would give him a little longer leash. Like there's so many people who are like, just read the first six books of this other series and it's good. <laughs> and it's like, well, could you just read two of Daniel Abraham's books? Like they're not that mm -hmm. long. Uh, but I get it. It's not like a, it's not like our Scott Baker where I feel weird recommending it to people. Um, but I don't ever expect people to like come away loving it. But so I was very excited that you enjoyed uh, dragon's bath uh, and you need to finish it up. You need I to, do, need I to do. get to it. I also need to finish the live ship trader. Jimmy. I, I saw it on your TBR, but you know, I just, I just said, okay, we'll see. We'll see when she gets to it. You know, my December TBR video is going to be spoilers for anybody who watches my channel. The December TBR video is going to be ship of destiny. <laughs> hero of ages there's going to be two books on it. i'm going to have to make that video about something else because i'm only putting those two books on the tbr yeah i saw that you hadn't i i could have sworn you read hero of ages but maybe it was alan mm -hmm. has alan read hero of ages he has he did and he refuses to post a review <laughs> there we go. that's right that's my right. january tbr is a secret alan what, what, what wait wait there's a secret tbr for january can you explain it without giving it away or i have made some mistakes as a human as a person haven't we all? and i'm trying to write those mistakes i'm trying to cast a more positive image out into the universe and my my january tbr will reflect my penance okay okay so there there is some transgressions being uh, addressed it sounds like mm -hmm. so you all want to make sure that you check out that january tbr video in a month and a half <laughs> Um, and, and you actually post your TBRs at the beginning of the month, unlike Alan who posts them like three months after. So that's kind of cool. True. Yeah, that's great. Uh, <laughs> well, let me tell you what I, uh, I did a Patreon hangout, my King's garbage, the high tier. We do a uh, hangout once a month and I had a little, uh, I had something to drink. It was my birthday weekend. Nice. So I, nice. and I may have pledged myself to read book two of lies of Locke Lamora when I don't have time to do so. 
But as a man of my word, I have to start that this week. And I got to try to fit that in like this first week of December, end of November ish deal, because I'm doing 2000 pages off my Patreon wheel. I'm going to, wow. I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to draw books until I hit 2000 Kindle pages. Mm -hmm. And then that'll be what I read in December. And I got to do two towers, but that's easy. It's, it's like my 80th reread. It'll be on audio. Yeah. Um, are you doing the new audio? I'm guessing you are. Yeah. 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 I've, I've done the old one before, but I, I love circus and uh, mm -hmm. I just did fellowship uh, in Hobbit for the last two months. So we're continuing and doing two towers here. So I'm, pr I'm pretty pumped. Uh, two towers is possibly my favorite of the three. So, uh, you know, getting helms deep and stuff will be cool hearing it from circus. Uh, so yeah, I have a little bit of a nebulous TBR as well in December. Like I have no idea what it could read. And I'm wondering if it's just going to be like 2000 page books and that's it. You know, it could just be really anticlimactic for a lot of people. <laughs> so my hope is that I get a lot of these, um, you know, books that have been on my Patreon pick for months. Like Three Body Problem has been on there and Children of Time have been on there for like two years. So I'm hoping read Three Body Problem. Yeah, it's one of those things I never I never pick it up. I don't know. Like when I have time and I look at it, I go, hmm. it's because it's a series. I think that's it. It's because it's a trilogy. I'm just like, can I really start this? Uh, I'm almost positive I'm going to love it. Like, I think you'll love it because it gave me an existential crisis. And whenever that happens, I feel like that's the kind of book that you will enjoy. Yes. I really like the three body problem, but it m messed with my my brain. Now, did you read all three then? I didn't actually. I only read the first one. I read it for a book club that I used to be in with my husband. So we read it together and both really liked it. Hmm. But I just never continued on. Hmm. Interesting. And but you felt, did you feel fulfilled at the end of book one? Like you didn't need to read book two? I liked it. And I, I also am a fan of open endings. Like I don't like nothing needs to end for me to like oh. it. I'm, I'm fine with never having a resolution about Let's anything. You're um, but <laughs> I feel like people are really coming down hard on you tonight. I like it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm garnering a lot of hate from the people who love me. It's uh, it's, it's a new thing. It's a new trend. Ever since I hit 10K subs, everything's changed. You know, uh, you're big league. You're big, big league. You know, now. 10K Jimmy is what they call me now. Uh, mm -hmm. So they should. <laughs> I'm just glad that there's another person in, in the sphere that doesn't care about endings because <laughs> that's probably why we both like the Dark Tower. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> okay, so you're you're okay with the open ending kind of feeling, and and that's why you didn't feel the need to kind of continue. But but you probably will. Don't I think so. I, I will probably read them at, at some point. Science fiction is a harder sell for me in general. The book is really dry, not in content. Like the language is really dry. I don't know if that is a translation thing or what. And the characters mm. are not the most dimensional, which is the thing that I have with science fiction in general. I feel like a lot of times they're going for the themes and they're going for the ideas and less about the characters. Uh, which is fine. When I read it, I'm prepared for that. But it's probably why I don't love as many yeah science fi like as as many science fiction greats as fantasy greats. Yeah, and I've seen some people say that in fiction, when it comes to like Eastern authors, that and and I've I've read the actual opposite of this as well, where they have some really compelling characters. Um, but I've also heard that there are times where like the uh, the the society that's mentioned in the book or the group of people is kind of the character in a way, mm -hmm. and yeah. that they all make up this larger idea of what this population is. And I think that that's kind of a neat way of going about it because I mean, you know, you can only read so many character driven stories. Um, Absolutely. And then things start feeling a little less original. So to actually, I kind of like getting distanced from characters. And sometimes just a good old, like straightforward character for me is a breath of fresh air, to be honest. Um, I, I don't mind it as much. And I think me and you are both also in the camp of we like sometimes when like bad people are just bad people. Mm -hmm. Like we like a good Lance a lot, you know, just a <laughs> despicable mother, you know, I just <laughs> easy to hate, you know, I don't that, need to empathize with some people, <laughs> some people I'm happy to just loathe. Yeah. I break my brain daily doing that in, in the real world. So sometimes it's nice to just, you know, feel justified in my uh, hatred towards a fictional character that doesn't exist. It feels yeah. good. It does feel good. I a hundred percent think that's one of the reasons why I love John Gwen so much is because he's just like, I'm going to craft this person that you're going to despise mm -hmm. yep. and you can all rejoice together on how much you hate this person. You will absolutely loathe them. Yes. Lycos is, is always on my brain. I, <laughs> there's a person right now reading uh, through faith from the fallen in my uh, discord 
and they are just like reacting to a lot of things that Lycos is doing. And I'm like, it's giving me life. I just love seeing people hate Lycos. It's my favorite. Do you want to hear a bad Faithful in the Fallen take? Kyle told me he was going to watch this through tomorrow. So we'll see because he will send me a message if he does. I already know where this he, is going, but yes, right? let's hear it. Let's when hear he it. Did, when he, he finished Ruin and he's like, that was underwhelming. It's like, what? This opinion is underwhelming. I'm underwhelmed by you as a person right now, <laughs> Kyle, but it's okay. We all like the things that we like. It's yeah, it's... Okay, but. It's one of those things I've been accosted for my my love of that series, um, especially coming from people who uh, who enjoy like very deep and nuanced uh, stuff that they read. Um, and like, how can you like this? This is such popcorn fantasy. And I'm like, I, that's because I, I love popcorn fantasy sometimes. Like sometimes that's what you need. And uh, mm -hmm. there's something about the friendships in that book and the relationships that, uh, you know, for some people might not work, but for me, it does. And again, I really enjoy hating uh, specifically Lycos. Very and it fun. just feels genuine and heartfelt. And I think that we've said this in every conversation we've ever had. <laughs> Sean Moon just seems like the nicest person. And when I read his books, I can believe it because the people who are supposed to be nice feel nice in an authentically nice mm -hmm. way. Like it doesn't feel overly sweet or anything. It feels like, yeah, this is just a solid guy. Like this is someone who cares about his friends and his family. And sometimes that's good. You know, sometimes we want to read people that care about their loved ones. <laughs> yeah, it, sometimes it, it's okay for everyone to get along, at least on one side of the uh, of the battle. Um, and also, I think uh, one thing that I came away from Faithful in the Fallen is I was like, man, I love these battles so much. And I thought that I enjoyed action and fantasy. And I don't know how you feel about this, but I actually <laughs> found out that I don't actually enjoy like battles and fantasy that much. Now, there are some, obviously, that I'm really into. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's actually more of an exception usually. Like I'm usually ready to get back to the the scheming or the dialogue or the fallout uh, rather than just the battles. But John Gwynn tricked me early into getting back into reading, thinking that oh, I like I want that fast pace, you know. I love action. this. No, actually, I just love John Gwynn. <laughs> yeah, I just enjoyed the way that he set that up. I thought that was so much fun. Uh, yes, first law. Sorry to jump in. I have an opinion because I just finished a first law book. I am going to go on the record right now. I have not recorded. I tried to record the review yesterday, oh, no. but I had recently been sick and I was recording multiple videos in a row and I started to cough and I was like, okay, I'll have to do this another time. I think that Red Country is the best standalone. Let's go, Sarah. We are, you know what? I think we might just have identical taste, okay? Because if you go look at my, one. if you go look at my Goodreads review and I almost deleted it because I'm like, I don't know if I feel this way anymore. Um, but it was my favorite of the standalones when I read through them. And I said it might have been my favorite first law book to that point. And people I also was debating. I was like, is this my favorite first law yeah. book? I don't know, because I like I look at the trilogy as a as an entire thing. And I when I was recording the review, I was like, is this the opposite of the hype that comes with most series? Like, was I expecting to be so underwhelmed that now it seems mind-blowing? But I don't care. It's good. People, the heroes is excellent. And this is where I was like, oh, the heroes is also like, I, I also really like the heroes. Besser Cold is the worst one, hands down. I do not care. Anybody can try to argue this with me. It is the, like, it is the, the most poorly paced. The characters are cool. Okay. It has some of the highest highs, but it's, it's just the worst of the three. I, I would say out of the standalones, yeah, best best serve cold is probably my least favorite. I still enjoyed it though. That, that, that maybe maybe I like, that's, I like all of his books. I say that might be my unique take for first law oh, outside of Red Country being the best. It's just me and you at this point, I think. Now there's some love for Red Country in the chat, actually. Um, I enjoyed all the standalones. Like it feels like it's a very varying experience for a lot of readers. Uh, I enjoyed Heroes a ton. Um, mm -hmm. I could understand why people don't like it. Best Served Cold, I thought, was just so different from the first trilogy that in a way was a little bit jarring. Yep. But Red Country, I have a bias. And I can't even say the bias because it will spoil the entire book. But things that were included in that series, or in that book, rather, is it, it doesn't matter. Like For me and, and what I enjoyed out of the first trilogy and those things being involved in that book, that's it. And I like Westerns. so I love Westerns. Ah. Right? Uh, is so good. I'm so glad you liked Red Country. I I was expecting like so you I was were getting ready. I could see you. You were folding in on yourself. You're like, nope, this is the moment she hurts me. But no, no, you I came through. You came through. You know what I really liked? It was a western. It felt like a western. Some of the character actions were so western, like from the beginning right to the mm -hmm. final scene. But it still felt like the characters. It felt 
true to the characters and what they would do, but also fit the Western aesthetic. I was very impressed. I was so happy. And then because like it's shit on Kyle time from a couple minutes ago, <laughs> then he was like, they're always on wagons. I was like, what are you talking about, Kyle? This book is only 450 pages. It's, it is the shortest first law book, isn't it? I don't know. I didn't check the other ones, but it might be. It, it does not feel like they're always traveling or anything else. I don't know. I really loved Red Country. I It makes me upset that so many people don't like it. Well, I'm glad that me and you can relish in our, our love for it because uh, I thought I was alone there for a long time. Um, Eric asks, about to finish Last Argument of Kings, should I jump into the standalones or start Age of Madness? You 100% should read the standalones, in my opinion. I, I think you would be doing yourself a little bit of a disservice. And I do think Age of Madness is the best stuff. Um, but it also it kind of... It's enhanced, I think, by the standalones, in my opinion. So uh, the world is moving along, which is one of the more unique things that Abercrombie does. He actually is switching eras, you know, going from like a more medieval time into uh, an industrial revolution. And a big part of that transition happens in the standalone. So I definitely think that you should check it out. Um, Adam, I'm going to guess is how this is pronounced, says, yo, big fan nuts, quick off topic question. Probably have you read or have slowly read Madness, gotten into contact with Baker recently about an interview or if how a potential third part is coming along? Uh, no, I have no information. Uh, I cannot seem to get any kind of contact information for our Scott Baker, and I don't think he wants me to. I don't think he wants anyone to contact him. Um, so unfortunately, no, I hate to break it to you. Um, the, one of the reasons why I was covering my face uh, whenever you mentioned first laws, because I swear to you, and now it's obviously a beloved series, right? Mm -hmm. But I feel like every time I talk about first law, it's just people telling me how it's not that good. And I know that that's like just me and my experience and like, you know, you're my... friends with Baron and he has this sad opinion about first law. But, but I think he, he likes first law though. He like... likes the original trilogy, but I think he then thought that it just, Aber Abercrombie was kind of a one trick pony. Well, that might not be untrue, honestly. True. I just really uh, like the trick. I might <laughs> like that pony just a little yeah. bit. Hey, uh, the people say that about Cormac McCarthy, too. Some people say he only writes uh, one type of protagonist, a strong male protagonist. And, and, I, and I happen to also enjoy his books quite a bit. So, yeah. you know, I, I think that's a, a criticism that gets levied on a lot of people. Um, though I think for Cormac, it's probably a little bit more unfair because he's done a lot of stuff. So have you read McCarthy? I've read The Road. Okay. Uh, that's the only one that I have read in its entirety. I did start Blood Meridian earlier this year. And nice. I uh, I guess I will say I DNF'd it. I was not okay. enjoying it, but I do want to read it. Actually, one of the very first things that I wanted to do on BookTube was do a series of videos about my favorite author's favorite books and how they inspired their work and how you can see like the threads of those books in their writing. And Blood Meridian is one of the books for Stephen King. So I have it on that list. I could easily swap it. Like Stephen King does interviews all the time. He's mentioned a million books that he loves. But now that I've written it on the list, I feel like I need to read it. Like I would be giving in <laughs> if I don't read it. So I will go back and read it again. But I had it from the library. So once I didn't mm. get it finished in the two weeks, I had to return it. And now I don't have it anymore. So I will I will still read it. But it I, I want to for that reason and, you know, just because so many people like it yeah and it's also been a massive influence on so many things you know um especially um i keep bringing up our scott baker and i always will uh but it really it definitely influenced his uh second series in uh print the second apocalypse and aspect emperor without a doubt uh i read blood meridian this month and i loved it uh it's a lot it's a it's a ton um, there's also some of the literary value there um and what i mean that i mean the references to like moby dick and stuff that i just don't I don't get because I haven't read Moby Dick. Um, I'm not that interested in reading Moby Dick, if I'm being honest. Um, I know that's heresy. So there's a little bit of that stuff, like the value there and some of the references uh, that are kind of lost on me. But I do enjoy some of the metaphysical aspects of it. And I think the ending is like one of the more uh, ridiculous things I've read. And I'm not even sure how I feel about it, uh, which is exactly how I felt at the ending of Aspect Emperor. Mm -hmm. Um but I can't stop thinking about the book. I mean, I finished it almost two weeks ago and I actually thought about rereading it. I thought about reading it on the way home. I ended up doing deadbeat instead. Cause I'm like, well, let's do a new book. Uh, yeah. But it's a book I'm definitely going to reread probably. Nice. No, I will. I will definitely re read it. I want to. And you talking about Moby Dick is really funny. So I've, I've talked with this a couple of times. I don't know with whom 
but my kids are now at the age where they're very intrigued by the idea of swearing. They're no, they know they're not allowed to swear. <laughs> so my son brought home this book about um, giant squids and sperm whales and giant squids are enemies. So they fight. So in the like fact part of the book it said, fun fact, there's a book called Moby Dick about a great white whale. And my son like obviously latched onto that immediately and was like, mom, have you read Moby Dick? Who's the author of Moby Dick? What happens in Moby Dick? Moby Dick is, and like I was, in my mind, I was trying not to do anything, but in my mind I was like, how many times are you gonna say Dick before you like, <laughs> stop expecting a reaction from me? But it just kept going and going. I was like, the moment that I either say something or laugh, it will never leave my house. Like he will literally only talk about Moby Dick. So I needed to stay strong, but it was really hard. <laughs> well, you punish him by making him read it. That's true. <laughs> I'm, buy him a copy for Christmas. This is your only Christmas gift. This yeah, put a poster up on the wall. Dick. Get him really, uh, get him a stuffed whale. Uh, you know, yeah. that, that, that'll work. I think he'll stop saying it at that point. Never talk about it again. <laughs> Darren, thank you so much for the 10 spots. Very generous of you. Says, I view First Law as a whole series and love the whole story. The standalones after I read them fe uh, feel like one story. Hopefully we'll, he'll come back to this world yeah i could see thinking of the standalones as kind of an arc right and a little bit you know all happening in the same world kind of uh almost like a throwback to the pulpier times of fantasy where you know between paragraphs you would jump to different characters and settings and uh like i'm thinking like dying earth kind of thing mm -hmm. um so very very cool uh and i would agree with you darren i i like the whole thing as well and thank you for the 10 spot very 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 kind of you uh alan very says excited for Age, Age of Madness. Madness. Yeah, you're going to like it a lot. If you, if, if you liked it to this point, there's no reason why uh, Age of Madness might not end up being your favorite. So uh, I'm going to reread the trilogy next year. That's my plan. Just the first trilogy, because I, I remember almost everything from the standalones and Age of Madness. But the first trilogy is like kind of, I don't know, it's not fresh in my brain anymore. Uh, obviously, there's some stuff that stands out. But I want to get back with the Northman and uh, and Giselle and, and the crew. And, you know, also see to see how I feel about it now because I have heard criticisms against it uh, that I acknowledge probably are legitimate. So I want to, uh, I want to see how I feel now that I've read, you know, hundreds of other books between then and now. Um, do, do you ever do that? Do you ever go back and reread favorites to see if you still like? I do. Some I'm scared to go back and reread. So like the, <laughs> the talisman, for example, <clears throat> you like that book. So the talisman is one of the first Stephen King books that I ever read. Uh, is it the first Stephen King book that I ever read? Because I read it before The Dark Tower. I think it is. I think it's the first book I ever read by Stephen King. And I loved it. But I was a kid when I read it. And the, the main character is a kid. And so I have heard, like, Mike, for example, Mike's, Mike's book reviews reviewed it and did not like it at all. And he really likes the coming-of-age stuff that mm -hmm. Stephen King does. And I'm sure that the criticisms were legit. I just have such fond memories of it and it made me sob. Like there's a part of the book that I just cried and cried and cried and I loved it. So mm. I am actually scared to go back and reread it. And I, I don't know. You were the only person I've ever heard that has enjoyed that book. <laughs> right? Like almost everyone hates it. So I don't know, maybe I would hate it. And so that is one that I definitely do not want to go back and reread. I have read reread so many of my favorites that I am confident that I still like them. Yeah. Um, but that is one that I have not reread. But I used to mm -hmm. only reread. Like when I was a kid, I didn't have any access to books because our town was too small for a library. And I only read the books that I had in my house. So I just read the same ones over and over again. I think that's experience for a lot of people, especially back in the day. Um, yeah. Yeah, the thing that intrigues me about Talisman actually has nothing to do with the book itself. It's the fact that Frank Muller did the audio that that's pretty much, at least I believe he did the audio. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I just want to hear more Muller on audio, uh, especially at the dark tower books. Uh, he, he really, he really became like my favorite narrator. It's a shame he passed. Um, David Sloan says, Jimmy gun to your head and match to your bookshelves. That's aggressive rank the four McCarthy books you've read. Um, so I'd say blood Meridian, the road, the, the road, I think personally, like I actually enjoy the road more though. I acknowledge that blood Meridian is a better book. Uh, the road has a lot of, um, personal meaning to me, uh, for 
personal reasons. And uh, it, it touched me in a, in a, in a different way. And when, when I read it, so I really, I guess the road and blood and are probably interchangeable. Then no country for old men and then child of God. And there's a pretty big gap between child of God and no country for old men. Not that I didn't think it was good. It's just, uh, I'll never read that book again. <laughs> it's, it's a, uh, it's a wild one. Have you heard of child of God by McCarthy, Sarah? No, I haven't. Did, did McCarthy write all the pretty horses? Yes, he did. Books? Yes, I believe that's movie book that one. Book. I think it's book one in, a, in the Border Trilogy. In the Border Trilogy? Yeah, and I just picked up uh, the rest of that trilogy, and I picked up Sutri, and uh, I did not pick up The Passenger yet, his new book. I have not, I've not got to that. I probably won't read his last final two books he's writing, which Passenger and the next one that's coming out next, I think, next month. I probably won't read those until the end, because uh, people say it's kind of his capstone, like he's done, you know, it's his swan song, and I don't want to read that before I finish the other stuff that I'm interested in. I'm not going to read his screenplays. I know people tell me to, I'm not going to, I have other stuff I want to read. <laughs> um, out of all of the books left of his that I'm interested in, such is probably the one that I'm most interested in. So did you like I'm the movie? I'm going to read child of God. What is it about? What is tell okay. me about it? So child of God is a character study about a, um, a murderer. How about that? Uh, someone who murders women and, in the mountains and in Tennessee, it, it's brutal. It, and, and there's not much of a plot. It's infuriating to read, uh, especially with the, like the ending of the story. And I mean, it's wonderfully written. Like it, it's, it's amazing. It's an amazing character study, but I can't imagine a lot of people would enjoy <laughs> reading about this. Uh, and I have a pretty, pretty wide palette when it comes to grim and dark stuff. Right. Uh, I don't it, Push I don't me. mind dark stuff <clears throat> if there's intent, right? Like, so was if the intention is torture porn, I'm not into it. Like, that's not not what I want to read. But if there's something to be gained or learned by yeah. reading it, I have a pretty high tolerance for whatever is going to happen. Like, I have heard a lot of the worst that humanity has to offer in person, like people telling me the things that have happened to them and having yes. to react in real time. So reading it in a book feels not nearly as intense as yes. that, but I don't want to read it if there's no like value to be gained from it. Yeah. And I'm not the guy to say like everything it accomplishes or aims out to accomplishment. Uh, you know, I, at the end of it, I said, well, that was a character study. And, uh, <laughs> and that was that. <laughs> and that was that it's beautifully written. And yep. um, I've never read anything like it and uh, I won't read it again. So that's kind of where I'm at <laughs> with it. Um, Dale Jones, thank you for the five spots. Says, have you ever read Clyde Barker for horror? The books of blood is a great start for fantasy. We've world is fantastic. Love both your channels. Well, thank you, Dale, very much. Uh, I think this question is to both of us. I'll answer first. Uh, I have tried to read damnation game, but I actually DNF it because I don't like the premise of making like a deal with the devil type deal. I thought his writing was really like, wild and i did enjoy it i think that his style is is very captivating but it was not something that uh just plot wise that was really meshing with me i got about halfway through it and uh yeah i'll read other clyde barker i'm very very interested in weave world for sure what about you sarah have you read any barker i have not but i do have weave world on my kindle so nice. i am going to read it i would think next year probably nice i um i saw weave world actually so when i go back home their bookstore is much bigger uh, like big, big Barnes and Noble. And they actually had a ton of Barker there. And my, my bookstores here, all three that I attend, none of them ever have any Barker. Wow. And I, I, I thought about picking it up, but I didn't. And I should have, because I know it's been on my Patreon wheel for a long time too. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm going to hit it. Uh, and that's a big book. It's like what? 800 pages. I don't know. Cause I have it on Kindle. So I, I don't, yeah. I haven't like, usually I can just look at them and see how chunky they are, but I'm not sure how, how long it is. Yeah, I uh, I see. This is what my problem with Kendall is that I can't judge how big they are. I don't get to watch the bookmark move. And I just messed up my TBR. Speaking of like reading uh, Red Sea under Red Skies, messing up my TBR. Mm -hmm. Like last week, I just randomly started Shadow March by Tad Williams, <laughs> which is a four book epic fantasy series that is extremely long. And I'm like, I just wanted like some high stake fantasy. Mm -hmm. So I just started it. I just started yeah. it. And I'm say, like, Tad Williams is probably super long. <laughs> what have I done? 
what have I done? I mean, the thing about Shadow March that's interesting, and someone dropped the comment, and uh, you know, if you're listening, thank you for giving me the uh, the information. But they said that Shadow March was it initially started being released as an online serial story in like 2004 or five, maybe, mm -hmm. and it was really big at the time. Like publishers, like this is like something that is gaining a lot of attention, and this is like you know maybe a new way of doing stories or something like this. Uh, may I shouldn't say new way because serial releases are always you know, publication, but uh, it started like an online release. So the structure of book one in Shadow March is a little weird. Mm -hmm. Like you, it almost feels like you're skipping time at points um, and things. I, I don't want to say just happen, but like you kind of zoom to the next plot point. And it's because it was a weekly serial release. And I guess eventually, you know, he had enough there and they said, hey, we want to publish this, make it a book. And I hear in book two, he does, has to do like a lot of fixing up and tidying up mm -hmm. to make this you know, a series of novels rather than an online serial release. So it's kind of interesting reading a book that that went through that process and how it feels a lot different than other things I've read from Tad Williams. But I'm having a I'm having an absolute blast. I have about 140 pages to go. And um, he wrote this in like, what, 2004. So, you know, uh, other stuff had kind of caught on. This is, you know, A Song of Ice and Fire had caught on. Obviously, Memory and Sarthor was before that and influenced that, blah, 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 blah. But it's interesting because you can kind of feel Tad writing to the more modern style of the genre as well. Like, I don't think it's as wordy as Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn. Mm -hmm. It is still pretty methodical, uh, which is Tad's MO. He, he takes his time. But I'm having a blast. It's wild. They're like tiny people the size of like, like erasers. Nice. And they ride mice, and I'm like, "Well, what is going on?" <laughs> Just so it you know, it sounds amazing. <laughs> it, it blew me away. And the thing is, the people, the person who finds these people, mm -hmm. is a funderling, which is a dwarf. But it, they're not dwarves. They actually even say in the book, "They're like we're funderlings. We're not dwarfs, but they're dwarfs." So these dwarfs find smaller people. It's ridiculous. but they're giants now. It's so ridiculous. <laughs> It's so, it's so, he always does something that's just out of left field. And that's why I like him so much. He's not afraid to get weird. He kind of embraces the genre more than trying to get away from it. You know? Nice. It's very Gulliver's Travels. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Have you read Tat? I haven't. No. All right. That's on your list now too. You need to, you need to get to that. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> I do. I do. <laughs> Do you someone just have it? Said, I was looking at that. I was like glancing at the comments for a second. There was someone who commented about the McCarthy book. Oh, that said the juxtaposition of Lester's actions and McCarthy's prose will conflict you like no other. Yeah. I'm this always... is how I feel about Lolita. I don't know if you've ever read that, but I, I almost picked it up this past uh, weekend, but I didn't. So that is the exact feeling of reading that book is like the things that happen are horrible. There is no justification for the topic you know what the book is about what the character does wants is but the writing is gorgeous <laughs> and mm. the way that he crafts the character and the way that like the language that he uses is just like it is such a strange experience to read it because you like there is such dissonance between the book that you're reading and what the book is about so may, i sounds like child of god is like that too I, I have not read Lolita, but from what I know, I think that that is probably very similar. Um, mm -hmm. And I have a lot of interest in reading Lolita just because of its reputation at this point. Right. Like, I just kind of want to see what it's all about and formulate my opinion and throw it into the ether. And everyone can forget <laughs> that, I, that I said anything. Um, Cole wants to know if I'm going to play the new God of War. Uh, after I beat the other one, which I read too much, so it probably will <laughs> never happen. Uh, Anthony, thank you for the 10 spot, my friend. Says tossing you a 10 spot for your Christmas shopping, Jimmy. I'm a fan of both of you. Well, we appreciate it very, very much. It's very kind of you. Um, I did go to Barnes and Noble and they had like the Barnes and Noble edition. So I picked up uh, the Iliad, I picked up Shakespeare's works. What else did I pick up? Shit, I can't remember. I picked up other things. I can't really remember. I did get a Ministry for the Future by Kim Stanley Robinson. I heard that that's pretty good. And I picked up other, some other fantasy series that I probably won't get to for five years. But um, this is the time of year. I don't know about you, but like I just buy things. Like I'm just like, I'll give that a shot. Throw it in the cart. Let's see. Sure, sure. Why not? Yeah. I The Barnes and Noble editions are really pretty. I mm -hmm. We don't have Barnes and Noble, obviously, so I've never seen or felt one. But they're pretty cheap. So like how would you say value for you know what what you are getting is in the Barnes and Noble 
so so the appeal to the the Barnes and Noble editions, and I have heard people complain uh, of like missing pages before and weak bindings. I've never had a bad issue, uh, like any issues with mine. The thing that is great about those editions is that they're things that may not necessarily have a modern print, and they might not have um, like a favorable print, right? Like the Count of Monte Cristo and the Stand. Like I have the Stand one. It stands a massive book, and the paperback has like kind of a weak cover, and and the font's a little small, you know. That edition is great, and it comes with like a little bookmarker, which I'm also a pretty big fan of. But I have a foundation, I have Dune, and they're great, they look great on the shelf. Um, you know, there are more modern printing of it while still having like a classics feel. Mm -hmm. So, I'm a big fan personally. I did, the thing is though, I they had buy one, get one 50% off. I think they raised the price of them because uh -huh. they were 40 bucks. I, 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 someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure like three years ago pre-plague i'm pretty sure they were like 25 bucks yeah i'm pretty sure they were because i remember looking at them and being like these are so cheap for yeah you know, exclusive editions because indigo does do some exclusive editions of their own and they're way more expensive than that yeah so i i think personally that they probably raised the price so i don't know if there were 40 but i don't know i don't know that's up to you you know the viewer but for me, I picked them up because I, I really want to read some uh, Shakespeare back because I actually enjoyed it in high school. I'm like one of those sickos that like I had a, I had a blast reading Shakespeare and I've never read the Iliad. I've never read Homer. So I, I got to do that. Right. So I, I, I don't know if you could say that I have read the Iliad. So I read the Iliad and the Odyssey. They're over there. I don't even know. I would like to actually run it by Alan to see like because I don't know who translated them, like if it's good, if it's not good. But I picked them up when I went through this huge like mythology craze when I was like 10 or 11. So mm -hmm. I picked up like a bunch of mixed mythology books, have this big I don't know, encyclopedia. There's like a book of Greek mythology. And then I bought the Iliad and the Odyssey and I read them, but I don't know how much of them I actually absorbed or like what I knew of what I was reading. I physically held the book in front of my eyeballs and read through it, but I'm I'm not sure that what happened there would would classify as having read and understood them. So I don't know. I should reread them, but I would like to know like what is a good translation. I don't know who who is the one like which is the one to read what I should. It's not Penguin Classic, Alan. It is some weird like blue book that I picked up probably on like the five dollar shelf <laughs> at chapters when I was able to go there and buy a book by myself for the first time. Yeah, I uh, I don't know what to I don't know what to expect reading it. I don't know if I'm going to like it or not, but I'm going to try it because it's so I mean, it's so important. Um, Philip says next time, pick up Beowulf, Jimmy. I know. And and Philip, you've actually told me exactly what translation I should try. Uh, that is another one I have to do. That is definitely another one. So have you read Beowulf? No, Sarah, where we're I have. So I have read parts of it. So in university, we did parts of it, um, but never like read through it on my own. Yeah, I, uh, I, I've, I've watched movies. I'm pretty sure I watched the Beowulf movie back in like the 2000s, and oh, I liked that it a lot. Horrible one with like, is it Angelina Jolie who's in it? <laughs> I don't know. I loved it. I was a kid. I thought it was the shit. Like I was like, this is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. My lovely wife has, uh, has aided me. So I never do book haul videos. Very rarely on the channel. But we're gonna go through what I bought today at Barnes and Noble, uh, so Please. people can see. Um, so this is the Ministry for the Future by Ken Stanley Robinson, which. Uh, probably would have got to you a little bit sooner, but it is super big. So I don't know, like 10 years, I'll read that. Um, ah, this is the other one I bought. And this is one I've been wanting to read for a long time. And that is Jurassic Park by Michael yes, Crichton. I love the Jurassic Park book. Yeah. And it looks so pretty. This is one of those Barnes and Noble editions that we were talking about. Um, by the way, uh, key, I hope I always, I don't know if I know if I'm pronouncing it right, but key says I bought most of mine for $20. They were in the sales section. So I think that they did go up uh, in price, unfortunately. Uh, speaking of th thick books, this is the Shakespeare, the complete works of Shakespeare, and it nice. is massive. They got a picture on there. I don't believe they actually know what he looked like. Um, I think that that's bullshit, but who knows? Uh, oh, I know what the other one was. It's Count of Monte Cristo, which my friend Jay loved this book this year, and it's one that I've also been wanting nice. to read for a long time. Everyone tells me I'm going to love it, so... We have should read, read that one together. I have the Count of Monte Cristo here, but I've never read it. Hey, you got to be careful because there's abridged versions out there that are really like, like a lot not of people giant. do. <laughs> yeah. Well, even the abridged versions like big, like it's not short. Um, 
my friend Amanda was like, oh, I did come out of Monte Cristo yesterday. And everyone's like, oh, that's great. And like, did you do the abridged? And she's like, no. And they're like, did you, are you sure? And she actually did do the abridged. And she's like, well, I'm never going to reread this. Like, there's no way. <laughs> I think I got it. You know, I think I got it. It's fine. Uh, what else did I get? Oh, this one's uh, actually my wife's. This is Kelsey's. Uh, Simone St. James, the Sundown Hotel. Motel? Interesting. Have you heard of this? Mm -mm. Dude. Kelsey, I know you're listening. Plug your ears. She's been looking for this book everywhere. And I'm like, just order it from Amazon. Just do it. Just give it to big old Jeff Bezos. Be done with it. We looked for this book <laughs> back, at, back at home for like a half hour. Mm -hmm. If she doesn't like this book, I'm kicking her out of the house. <laughs> done. <laughs> I've been hearing about this book for weeks. I'm tired. It better be a five-star read. That's all I'm saying. Kelsey, you can unplug your ears now. Also, these are either your favorite Christmas present or Christmas is canceled. It better. It better be excellent. It better be. Uh, and this is the Odyssey one. And actually, this is my favorite uh, book cover from the uh, from the editions that I got from Barnes and Noble. Uh, it has like a cool rustic look and on the back. There's two dudes fighting with like shields and stuff. I like um, it. So and it's not as thick as the complete works of Shakespeare. So there's a good chance that that'll get read before uh, maybe anything else on this list. And then. There's this, and this is the one I wanted to talk about, and I couldn't remember what it's uh, called. It's written by Troy Carroll Butcher, Butcher, Lies of Descent, and it's it's a book, one of a of a um, series, and I don't know if anyone's read this, but it's a 4.3 on Goodreads, and the series is called The Fallen Gods War, book one, and it sounds like uh, basically there's this victorious army on like this continent, and they're in search of a new homeland and all this stuff. And there's like this old ancient race of people and they find two kids that have the blood of that. And now they're being forced to learn the old ways. They're like children of the old folk. And I don't know. It just sounded really interesting. It's supposed to be a trilogy. Um, I'm a little worried. It's going to have the abusive mentor trope that I'm just so sick and tired of reading about. Like I'm just after Stavely, I'm done. Like I don't want to. Wasn't that your favorite part of <laughs> Brian Stavely's book? <laughs> It in fact wasn't. It in fact was not. So I'm hoping that if it's in here, it's at least a little bit brief. Um, not that it can't be done well. I'm just tired of reading about it. I don't know. I would just like to say that people don't learn unless they're buried to their neck, Jimmy. <laughs> That's it is a tried and true technique. Ask Alan, he's a teacher. Yeah. And... Waterboarding, you know, is always encouraged <laughs> in the classrooms nowadays. Um, uh, is it Penguins class classics? I don't think these ones are. I don't think so. I think they're just um, Barnes and Noble. So there's uh, my once a year book haul. There you go, folks. Yeah. Round of applause, please. I, I I assume everyone's clapping at their keyboards. Um, I would love to read Count of Monte Cristo with you, though, if you want to. We can schedule that for 23. Let's do it. I think it'll be great. Um, a bridge version cuts the list of ships as well as a bunch of other stuff. Okay. <laughs> it seems like a lot of people like Odyssey in the chat, too. Okay. Sarah, do you prefer prose or poetry? I prefer prose, but I feel like maybe you should read the Iliad and the Odyssey in verse. I don't know. Hmm. Is that it? You're a you're a classicist. Yeah, you tell us. Alan, you tell us. Should should it be read in verse? <laughs> Fantasy Fanatic says Shadow March is about people writing mice. Durfee is dumbfounded. Actually, the book is very much not about people writing mice. It's just like the piece of it that keeps sticking out. Like it, it's such a small piece of the story. I shouldn't sell it like that. It's not like the main part. <laughs> I wish that I could have a video of Brian Lee Durfee reviewing every book that has ever had an animal in it <laughs> because it's just, it's the best. Like I love Watership Down, but his review of Watership Down might be better than Watership Down. Like, it's <laughs> that, and the Red Wall one is also excellent. It's just, they're so funny. I, I want more of them. Yeah, I had him on last episode and he was like talking about his red wall and he's still as confused as he was the day he shot it. And okay. he hearing him go over like how he used to try to act like he had a <laughs> he had a running storyline in his early videos that his bookshelves were haunted. So he tried to like have things on strings and like pull it, but he was obviously pulling in the video. One of the funniest moments on Jag with Nuts. Like I, I watched it back after and I was laughing so hard I was crying. Mm -hmm. Um gave Alan a run for his money, even I would say. Um yeah, 
Brian Lee Durfee is over in, I think, Germany right now, having a blast. And his third book comes out here in a few weeks. So uh, I got a couple of people that are catching up in my Discord and they're uh, reading Forgetting Moon and having a blast. So it's really great. Did you did you end up finishing the Forgetting Moon? I didn't. I haven't gone back to it. I do want to read it like I was liking it. It's just that I could only read one of them at the time and Dagger and Coin won out. Although was not expecting a whale hunting scene at the beginning because I'm scared of whales. And I was like, what is this? We, Why is this here? This is a very whale centric stream. Like we, we, <laughs> we talk about Moby Dick. <laughs> right. Why does this keep happening? We might have to do a movie. Wait, why are you afraid of whales? I have, the hip no idea. I, I have no idea. Jamie. I'm not scared of sharks. I'm not scared of anything else. Like I'm, I'm only scared of whales and I, I have no idea why. Have, have you ever I met ever a whale? Told you this? So I'm sure I've talked about this in some sort of live stream before, but it, t- it tells you about my fear of whales and also why children are evil. <laughs> so I am scared of whales and I have, have been for a really long time. Like I watched Free Willy when I was young and I don't remember being super scared of it then, but orcas are the ones that I find least scary, which is funny because they're objectively the scariest. So I have always been frightened of them. And then when Juliet was young, I'm going to say two or three, she found out that I was scared of whales. And she thought that it was the funniest thing that she had ever learned. Because I guess to her, like grownups are not scared of anything. So she treasured this piece of information. And we didn't have a TV at home and they, the kids were never allowed to watch TV. So when we used to go to like Walmart, for example, they would be super excited about the TV because it'd be there and they'd be like, what is this? Like what, what's happening? And so one day I get called over like in Walmart and she was like, mommy, mommy, come here. I want to show you something. I was like, oh, she sees something on the TV again. Like, this is cute. So I walk over and there's a big fucking whale like just <laughs> jumping up out of the ocean i was like what ah! and so and she died laughing and like it clearly got the reaction that she was looking for so from then on she decided that whales and not only whales blue whales the most frightening for me were her favorite animal so then we had to buy her books about <laughs> blue whales and about animals in general and then obviously she would ask me to read them so she'd be like i don't want daddy to read it i want my which is clearly like emotional manipulation i shouldn't have fed into it but when your daughter asks you to read a, a book you're gonna do it so <laughs> i read it kept reading them and then one night i go to the gas station with my friend and I go to take my wallet out of my pocket and I shit you not, Jimmy, I reach into my pocket and there's a fucking whale in my pocket, like a toy that she planted in there. She put it in so that I would find it. So the next day when I went home, I was like, so Juliet, I found a whale in my pocket. And she was like, hee, and like so pleased with herself. But on the upside, she kind of gave me exposure therapy. So I find it much less frightening to look at pictures of whales now. So I'm I'm a lot better with it. So I guess she, she helped, but it was evil. So would you say that you're uh, not in, in support of freeing Willie? No, <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that. I like whales. Like I think that they are cool creatures. I'm happy that people like them. I just don't like them. Have you seen blackfish? No, I feel like you would like it. Um, it's, it's whales being like captive and abused at SeaWorld. I feel like you would be in support and of killing this. people because they're psychotic. Like, yeah. Like you would be the one viewer that comes out of it going, they're doing good work over there at SeaWorld. Like we really like what we're seeing over there for the orcas. Oh. I did, this is your, this is your villain origin story. Um, it was. And I actually put, sorry, his name is Isaac. So he's, <laughs> he's just more shy. So I don't talk about him as much. Juliet is not as shy, but his, my son's name is Isaac. Um, but I actually, so one of the things that I always wanted to do, um, was I, like, I had this like bucket list and on it, it, I wish I had the notebook here. Cause I would show you, it says face your fear, go on a whale watching tour. And I did it last summer and I was so scared, but I did it. Okay. I'm sorry. This is going off on a total tangent. Let's go. When I got accepted to med school, there was a week of orientation and I went to med school in Newfoundland, which is where I'm from. But I guess like there's a lot of people that come in who are not from Newfoundland and they want to do like Newfoundland things with them. So one of the events on the med school freshman week, whatever you want to call it, orientation is, and I'm really sorry that I'm sw- like, I'm swearing more in this stream than I have in any other one. Go it's off. Like, You're fine. Whale watching tour, Jimmy. <laughs> and it's the only 
only mandatory event, like everything else you could skip. But this whale watching tour is the only mandatory. I get seasick and I'm scared of whales. So I'm going into med school. I was a French literature student, so I knew no one. There was all the biochem people who were friends. Like, And then the one thing that they make me do is go on this whale watching tour. And I was like, do I want to be so sick that I just am in the bathroom throwing up? And so if there is a whale, I don't have to see it. Or do I actually want to not throw up in front of all of these people that I now have to spend the next four years with and instead let them see me cower in fear? Thank God we didn't see a whale. Sorry to every mainlander who came to Newfoundland from med school, but I am happy that you did not see any whales on that tour because it was horrible. I can't believe that was the one mandatory event. Why? Probably because it costs like $80 a person to go. So they were like, if we're paying for this, everybody's right. getting on. But I was I was not happy about it. You know, I, I think of the movie 23 with Jim Carrey and how 23 just keeps popping up in his life. I feel like you're you know, you're just seeing whales, you yes. know, because it, it's in your mind. I, I, th I think we have to have a talk. I mean, this is this is some troubling stuff. Anyway, I saw one last summer. We went on the on the tour. I was happy we saw one. Most of them jumped in the distance, which I was good with. One swam under the boat which I did not like. So I saw it, it like did its thing, but then it swam on and I was like, oh my God, it's going to jump and then we're going to flip over and then I'm going to be in the water with it. And, and it's going to be the worst thing that has ever happened to me, but it didn't, it just swam away. It would be the last thing actually. That has ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> that would be it. And I'd be expected to rescue my children, like and make sure that they swim ah. away. And oh. Uh, Tanner says was in a kayak in Alaska in a whale pass close by. I've never recovered. We don't belong in the ocean. I, I would Agreed, tend Tanner. to. The ocean is very scary. Uh, Dale, thank you so much for the five spot. Uh, it's a little bit off topic, but says Jimmy, who is a better villain, Griffith from Berserk or Kenneth from Live Ship Traders? And this is a great question. Oh man, that's so tough. Uh, Kenneth is more close to home. Like Kenneth is possibly one of the most fascinating characters because of the fact that he is so human and that we want to see people succeed around him. Uh, and there are people like Kenneth who exist in the real world. Whereas Griffith, the thing that I find more interesting about Griffith is that it is, it gets a little bit more into like the metaphysical stuff. And there's a lot more like headier trippy stuff that happens in berserk. So even though they're really similar, they kind of go different ways. Um, it's also hard because Berserk's not finished yet. Uh, we will get a finish, it seems, which is great. I think I'm going to go with Kenneth because I know how that story ends. Griffith is up in the air still, but I think there is a really, really good possibility that Griffith will end up uh, eclipsing. That's uh, such a good pun. Eclipsing um, <laughs> Kenneth. If you're a Berserk fan, you're watching this and you don't give me props for that pun. I, I don't know what to tell you. David, thanks for the five spot. Um, you read manga. You know, me and you've talked about it a bit. Uh, and, and we haven't really talked about this ever, I think, on YouTube. But we're reading Monster together. Yeah. And it is excellent. It is excellent. It, it, where does it rank right now? I, and I, th what volume are you on, by the way? Because you're reading the same editions as me, I think, right? Yes. Um, I haven't read the most recent one that you read. Is it four? The most recent one that you read or five? Might be five. It might be, might five. be five. So I think I've read the first four. I haven't read five yet. Okay. Wh how are you feeling? Because I read four and when I finished four, I read five in a day. Like it was, it was immediate. I was like, I'm just going to keep going. And I've, st I, I slowed down a little bit. Cause like, I thought I was behind you. So now that you're behind me, I, I feel better. Um, so I slowed down a little bit, but like, where, where are you at with it? Like, how do you feel? I really, I really like it. So I, it is not what I typically read. So I don't read a lot of, so for anyone who doesn't know, Monster is a murder mystery, essentially. So we have a doctor who saves the life of what he thinks is an innocent boy. And then mm. that boy grows up to be a monster. And so we're trying to figure out why he's doing the things that he's doing. And I don't read a lot of books like that. <laughs> Alan did tell me about Monster, actually. Yes. I To be fair to Alan, I started reading it before I knew him. I just didn't continue because I didn't have any any other volumes. But I, I really like it so far. I want to read more of it. Maybe that's what December will be. It will be Hero of Ages, Ship, Ship of, of Destiny, Destiny, and all of Monster. And all of Monster. I, I, 
let, why not? Let's just pile it on. <laughs> do it. Let's do it. I really want to read Tokyo Ghoul next year, which Ooh. is another like limited series. So I think there's mm -hmm. 14 volumes of the original Tokyo Ghoul. And my husband had watched the anime, which is interesting because Patrick had told me, read the manga because the anime doesn't do a good job of adapting it. My husband had watched the anime and he's like, I don't know what Patrick's talking about. The anime is awesome. I love it. He had never read the manga. And then he read it and he was like, oh, I'm sorry, Patrick, you were correct. Like now that I have read it and have also watched the anime, I think he still likes the anime because he saw it first and, you know, enjoyed right. it for what it was, but he really liked the series. And because it's short and kind of a limited one, then I think it, it'll be a good one for me to read next year. So I want to finish up with Monster and read Tokyo Ghoul. Nice. Very nice. Yeah, I uh, I think Monster is the best manga I've read, and I would go as far as to say, and I'm not done with it, so we'll see. It could change, but I think it's one of the best stories I've ever read with some of the best characters I've ever read, and that doesn't matter what medium it is in. I think it's the perfect manga for people who aren't sure about the medium or, yeah. or you know, maybe don't want to go into some of the other stuff. I can't believe it hasn't been made into like a live action HBO show or something. Like It would be perfect. Like they do live action, everything else. Like they're trying to do live action one piece and all this stuff. And it's like, I don't know. I don't know how that stuff's going to work out. But if you want to do a live action manga, Monster, it, yeah, Monster is down to earth. It, it, it's not it's not fantasy. It's it's a psychological like crime thriller mystery. And it's, I mean, you want to talk about antagonist. Johan has to be up there. Mm -hmm. Has to be. Um, and I don't even know anything about it. <laughs> right? That's great. the, that's the, okay. That video did things to me. So, this is also going to this is going to make you question my family and what they're like. But my sister sends me these videos so that she can laugh about it. So like, ha ha, ha look, send this, and she'll send me these horrible whale videos, and it's just awful. <laughs> I want like every five minutes. I want us to come back to whales. Like I feel like that's the <laughs> theme of tonight. Keep bringing it back. I'm just gonna start quoting Moby Dick. I feel like I got to read it now. I've I've set, talked about it so much. Um, mm -hmm. Dale agrees. Monster is peak fiction. And Kay says uh, that Del Toro tried at HBO and mm -hmm. they turned it down. What? That makes me so upset because it that would is. be so damn good. And Alan, you can be a part of our discussion when we talk about Monster because you are the reason why I read it. And I would love the because I actually watched the anime as well. And then I stopped at a certain point and then just picked up the manga. Um so yeah, yeah. It sounds like you got some good plans. Tokyo Ghouls one. I have a uh, the first volume, but I haven't I haven't started it yet. I got to get uh, caught up on Berserk, and I'm reading Vinlin and and obviously Monster. So, um, and if you love Monster, then you can read 20th Century Boys. Yeah, I keep looking for it, and it's like impossible to find volume one. It is. They were very difficult to find, so I had difficulty with a couple of volumes for 20th Century Boys, and then I just set alerts on all of them. So whenever one came in stock, I would then buy that one that was in because I think I got them all from Book Depository, and you can set alerts on Book Depository for them to like email you when it's when it's in. I have heard this so, and I think there's even one on one of the covers, isn't there? Like there like a is giant th mech whale looking. There creature. are some whales in Dandelion Dynasty. You may it might might edge into horror for you. It's true. <laughs> it will. <laughs> Colton is upset. He said, "I tried for a year to get Sarah to read Berserk, which is 100 percent a rally. I would agree with that, and she wouldn't do it. You ask her once to read Monster, and she does it instantly. I'm Colton, salty. Don't turn into Alan. Like, be my nice friend." Not, not like Alan. Don't take, don't take his path. <laughs> <laughs> There's so many feuds Alan's in. I can't even keep track at this point. Right. Uh, and, and Dale, uh, don't worry. I can get a copy of 20th century boys. I just do this thing where if I can't get it in person, I just keep hunting it. Cause it's like a fun thing. But like, if I want it, I'll just order it. It's not, it's, I can get off Amazon if I need to. Um, but yeah, manga is weird. Uh, you know, there are books that are kind of elusive, but I feel like manga actually runs out of prints at times. And it's, it it's, does. Uh, it's weird. And then I get scared that it's not going to be printed because maybe it didn't have, you know, maybe the English release didn't have the response that they were hoping for. Thank you. Yeah. Mindelin, you are, in fact, the nicest friend. He is very, yeah. very kind. <laughs> whale adjacent. <laughs> you know, what's actually funny. Let's bring the whales back. Mindelin's wife made my daughter a whale purse. For her, it's a galaxy whale, so it's like a whale that looks like a galaxy. <laughs> I can't go take it out of her room because she's asleep, but I think I have a picture because I think I sent one <gasps> to Mindlin. And, and on a side note, uh, Philip is going to go finish reading The Dark Tower. Ooh. Oh, my. Fantastic. 
Enjoy. Yes. Let's see. And Fantasy Finex having a hard time finding Vinland Saga 7. Yes, I have a friend um, who's been borrowing because I have them all. I have all the published ones. So I've been I've been letting uh, my friend borrow whenever he runs into the shortages because it, it's real. It's very real. The Villain Saga ones are so nice. The hard covers, they look beautiful. All the colors. Mm -hmm. They're right here. I got them all sitting back here on my shelf. That's true. It was a whale shark. There we go. He wouldn't send me a whale. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kay says the coda is the best bit. Agreed. For sure. Look at how hostile Philip was. <laughs> I, I need to see this uh this whale purse though. I'm very know, curious I'm how you turn a whale shark into a purse. Um we and... went for a hike, and obviously, because my kids are nerds like me, we couldn't just go for a walk in the woods. We had to bring notebooks so we could write about our walk in the woods. <laughs> so she had to bring her whale purse so that she could put the notebook in it. Okay, let's see if I can hold this up to the camera. So here it is on her like side. You can see like its eyes pointing up. So it's. Yeah, it's creepy. Yep. Yeah, it's up. So the and it just like goes around, goes around like her shoulder. So <laughs> there we go. It's a galaxy whale. It's actually really cool. And she loves it. She. That's awesome. Absolutely loves it. Yeah. So. My, Mike. Mike is a fantastic dude. Yeah. And uh, and and so is Robin. So we, we we appreciate them. He actually sent me this shirt I'm wearing. This Fantasy Network shirt is actually made by Mendelin and his family. Nice. So big shout out to Mendelin uh, in the fam. We appreciate you a ton. Yeah. Um, now I, I brought up the Justice of Kings with Richard Swan. Ha, ha, did you read it yet? Yep, yep, I read it. It was and, the first and you one liked that I read it this month. I did like it. It was really fun. I don't know how long it'll stick with me. Like, I don't know that it's going to be one of those books that I always think about or that I hold all the details in my mind, but I had a, I had a lot of fun reading it and I will enjoy reading the rest of the series. Yeah. And it's only what a 400 page, 450 pages. It's pretty it's short. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, for us, it's short. Most people would be like, that's <laughs> a massive book, but for us, yeah. And with book two coming out, I kind of want to get to it. It was uh, probably the book at, I didn't know much about, but I was most excited for this past year. I mean, there was obviously the the other stuff that I was excited for, like Fairy Tale by King was probably my most anticipated, which I read the first three chapters and I actually shelved it, not because I didn't enjoy it, but because I was getting influenced by the discourse around it. Everyone telling me like, you know, this is how it is. Good. This, this is bad. You know what I mean? And I was like, I need to be removed from this for a while yeah. uh, until I get it. But you read Fairy Tale, right? I did. And the verdict? So my opinion was very similar to many people who read it. I liked it. I really liked the beginning, like so many people did. And I liked the middle less. And I really liked the ending. Okay. When I talked about it, I said that I was trying to remove myself from the book that I had hoped it would be. Mm -hmm. and review it for the book that it is because after seeing the cover and the the design and assuming that it was going to be very closely tied to the dark tower i was really sad when i did not get what i wanted from it and it wasn't <laughs> fair because i had imposed my own like hopes on this book for what it would yes. be and i think what it is is what stephen king wanted to be like i think it succeeds well yeah. in terms of what what he was trying to do but it was not what I was hoping for. I was hoping that there was going to be one last book that really like strongly tied in. I wanted it to be like the talisman, but a Stephen King who is writing the talisman post dark tower with like all of those years mm -hmm. of experience behind him and you know, everything that he has learned and built since then. So I, you know, I was really hopeful and like even some things that me too, Tanner, but like even some terms that are established across his portal fantasy books and things that exist, for example, in the talisman, I was even expecting just some references to those types of things and for similar ideas to come up and they did not. And I, it took a lot out of me because I, I, I was convinced. So I was sure that this is what we were getting and we didn't. <laughs> And so I was really disappointed, but it wasn't the book's fault. The book was fine. I think it is a bit bloated um, and, and, you know, probably could have used a little bit less of the middle, but it was still fine. It was just sad. 
Yeah, I, everyone I know that uh, mm. that was looking forward to Fairy Tale was looking forward to the connections to Dark Tower. Like everyone examining the cover, going into the synopsis, people were counting the words and sent. I mean, craziness, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that there was probably a lot of expectation around this book that maybe didn't line up with what it actually was. And that's one of the harder things whenever you're reviewing a book is like, okay, how much of this uh, you know, 20 minutes, let's say for a review of this book, how much of this 20 minutes needs to be about the fact that my expectations were wrong. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, I kind of feel that way about Augustus by John Williams, uh, Alan and everyone's read it this uh, month and absolutely loved it. And I can confirm it is a beautifully written book. And I, I would dare say a phenomenal book. Uh, and I ended up saying not right now, I'm not going to call it a DNF cause I'm going to read it. Yeah. I did not know that it was letters it's just letters back and forth between multiple characters. And I have no really reference of the history. Alan sent me a, a awesome Voxer message. It was like 10 minutes long explaining me to the backdrop of the story, which was fabulous. And I learned a lot. I read, uh, in fact, I'm almost done with the book. I probably should just finish it. I think I have a hundred pages left. Okay. Um, but my God, it was great. But my expectations were not that they were, it was not to read letters back and forth, uh, between all of these people in Rome and, uh, and whatnot. So for me, it was like, this isn't what I was hoping it to be at this time. Uh, you know, do I do a review of that? Do I, when I do my wrap up, cause I'll probably talk about my wrap up. Like do, how do, how do you talk about that? Did, do, what, how do you balance the subjective experience that you had and your expectations that were wrong Absolutely. with what it is? Because what it is, is tremendous. Like it's really great. And I could even tell I was enjoying it because I'd be like halfway through one of the letters and at the beginning of the letter, I'm like, oh, here we go. Another person. I don't know. OK, here's a letter. <laughs> Mid letter. I'm in. I want to know all the drama that they're talking about. I'm getting to know this character like he's able to establish multiple characters out through one letter. And at the end of the letter, I go, damn, that was so good. And then another letter starts from someone else. And I go, I don't care about this part. Middle of the letter. I'm like, oh, my God, it's great. So it just kept happening, but I kept losing momentum. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And. For everyone listening, you're going to hear that in my wrap up because that's probably what I'm going to say about the book. Um, but I'll read it again. But yeah, whenever you're doing a review, like you said, you're you know, talking about fairy tale. It's like, how much of this do I, I, I put in? Um, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a tough mix. It is hard. And we have coming into things from book two, we have higher expectations sometimes than the average reader because we hear so much from I mean, we do not exist in a vacuum. We have so many bookish opinions mm -hmm. that are coming at us all the time. So I think... It's a little bit easier sometimes to fall into that trap, but yeah, it's interesting. I, I will read Augustus. I have it on audio um, and I just haven't listened to an audiobook this month. Like usually I listen to them if I'm like cleaning or doing other things and I just haven't had the chance to to do it the yeah the, the, the audiobook's great there's a lot of names to keep track of so I, I was having to do the physical along with it but i love that narrator he's the same guy that did stoner which was fantastic okay. um have you read butcher's crossing you said you like westerns no i haven't i've read very few westerns so i don't watch a lot of tv or movies but i have watched a lot of westerns because my mm -hmm. dad really liked them and i had an older cousin <clears throat> who sadly passed away a couple of years ago. Um, but he grew up just a couple streets away from me and we were really close when we were younger and he really loved Westerns too. And he actually had a horse and the horse would come like to my house all the time. And so we watched a fair number together as well. Nice. I think, uh, I think you would like butcher's crossing quite a yeah. bit. It, it's, it's not so much the macho Western as much as is, is like a connection between someone in the land and like the changing of the times mm -hmm. and, uh, how someone who isn't involved in, in the expansion in the West uh, coming there and like realizing that like life is totally different here. Yeah, Butcher's Crossing is a great book. I mean, John Williams is uh, probably one of the best authors I've ever read at this point. Stoner's definitely a top 10 book for me. I've uh, heard so many good things about Stoner. I went to add it on Goodreads and realized that I had already added it and I added it pre booktube. So I have no idea where hmm. I heard of it or why. I guess it must have popped up just someone I knew on Goodreads must have reviewed it. And I thought, well, you know, I should read that, mm -hmm. but I do, I do want to read it. Yeah. We're, uh, we're coming to the end of the year, you know, so everyone's going to be doing top 10, you know, lists and stuff. And it's always my favorite time. And I'm like, do I, get, do I have to change my channel name of stoners, my book of the year? Like, do I have to change from the fantasy network? Like, do I have to be the, <laughs> the literature network? Like, I don't, you know what I mean? Like I feel, I feel it would feel a little dirty. 
if I didn't put a fantasy book at my number one spot, but it might happen. I don't know. I haven't got, I have to sit down with like a glass of whiskey and just be like, I got to hammer out this list. Like I got to figure, I got to make some tough decisions. Some people are going to get hurt because I obviously all authors watch my videos because they love me. Of clearly, course they do. Of course they do. <laughs> um, you don't have to say it because I know we like to keep the suspense, but is your number one book of the year already decided? Are you pretty confident in that slot? In I don't, I don't know. So one of my favorite books of the year was nonfiction and it is a book. So I talked about it in a wrap up. It is a book that was almost perfectly written for me. So I don't even know how to recommend it or if I should recommend it to other people, but it is, it was written like to fit my taste exactly. So it's called bitch and it's about the female <laughs> members of this, of the animal kingdom. And it is a combination of like an episode of animal planet and read empire of the vampire this year, Alan, <laughs> Sadly. Um, and the book Invisible Women, which is another nonfiction about like the data gap in scientific research and how it is kind of biased towards men because a lot of the studies that go on use men as like their prototype or their subject. Hmm. So this book, this nonfiction, it's by a woman named Lucy Cook. There's not a whale, Charmaine, thank God. <laughs> 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 but it's a it, she she wrote another book that I really like called The Truth About Animals, which is just this really wacky book about like really random animals and a bunch of weird facts about them. And I've read a lot of animal books and watched a lot of animal like documentaries. And I didn't know many of the things in this book. So it really impressed me when I read it. And so when her new book came out this year, I really wanted to read it. And it was about her career. So she is a zoologist turned author and I don't know if I ever told you this before but that is what I had wanted to study so originally I was going to study zoology and evolutionary biology and I had been accepted into a like university program that was outside of Newfoundland had like paid the deposit on my room and like all of these different things wow. and then just financially I got offered a scholarship for the university that's here in Newfoundland and it made a lot more sense to stay and they didn't have a zoology program so I just went into like the regular biology stream right <laughs> That's not why, but that also fits. Um, so that that was what I had planned to do with my life originally. And that's not the way it worked out. I ended up going to med school. But mm -hmm. I, when I read this book, it is about her career as like a young female zoologist and some of the barriers that were there, but also how she found that even like at the highest level, like studying at the PhD level in evolutionary biology, there is this data bias that people totally ignore and try to explain their way out of because obviously Charles Darwin is like the man in evolutionary biology and as he should be, but there's a lot of kind of even saying gender is silly because animals don't really have gender, but for the purposes of the book, she did use that term. And so there is this like gendered data bias in the animal kingdom that does not account for like the huge spectrum in sexual dimorphism and diversity mm. and sexual selection. And actually a lot of the evidence around sexual selection in animals was influenced by Victorian views on how women should behave and what women should do because hmm. a lot of the data comes out of that time when a lot of wealthy upper class men were doing a lot of the field work in evolutionary biology because if you were a gentleman of leisure like that's what you did you know go pick up some seashells on the beach or like study eels or whatever it was that people did to like you know have a scientific hobby Whales. when they didn't yeah. need to have a job uh so it's it was it's so fascinating so it talks about her research and like meeting all of these other female and male in, in some situations, scientists who are publishing data and, and doing these studies and finding things that completely contradict how the theories of sexual selection work, but no, like people will just flat out refuse the data or they will find ways to explain around it and why this is like the one exception. So this book highlights a ton of different species and how they behave in ways that we don't classically think of animals hmm. behaving in the animal kingdom. And so it talks a lot about like sexuality and variety and behavior. And some of that comes back again then to humans because the data we have about animals is a product of how we thought about people at the time. And it's just so cool. 
and I really like my job and I'm really happy with the way that my life turned out, but reading it, there was just a moment of like, oh, to be one of these women who, who are studying this, like this part of evolutionary biology would be so cool. So yeah. cool. she is, I love her. My husband's dying out on the couch, but like <laughs> she is the best and I love her books. I think she's so cool. One of the, like the smartest, coolest women. So I really loved her book. So is that going to be my favorite book of the year? I don't know. Will anyone except me like it? I also don't know. It but I like it enough for everyone. <laughs> so. so we both have non-fantasy books that we are gushing over and we're we're conflicted. We're not mm -hmm. sure where we belong anymore. Um, exactly. I mean, you're going to change your career and go hang out with whales and figure out, you know, their sexuality. I think that's great. I think you should pursue it. Um, <laughs> Jennifer Robbins says, Sarah, you should read Creatures of the Kingdom by James Mishner. I think you would really like it. I probably would. I will add it. I'm going to leave that one to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, who, who is the author of the book you were just talking about? Lucy Cook is her name. Lucy Cook. And it's called? Cook. Bitch. I just wanted you to say it again. <laughs> You know, I, you know, I bring people on and there, there's certain people I know. I'm like, okay, it's going to be a, a highly parental advisory type thing. But I mean, you're, you're going off. You're talking about sexuality and animals. You're swearing about, I mean, my God, Sarah. Right. You, you support SeaWorld. I mean, this is, <laughs> so, you've become a grim, dark booktuber uh, out, of, out of nowhere. Right. The last time I was, I was talking about how I punched someone in the face when I was younger. And now we're going on to, that now is we're going on to this. That's that true. is true. I forgot about that. You bring out the worst in me, Jimmy. That's I like to think that I bring out the worst in everyone. I like to put people down to put, build myself up. And that's why that's how I got to 10K, you know? <laughs> <laughs> David, thank you for the five spot, man. It says, buy half a book with this and talk about how Brandon Sanderson couldn't win a sixth grade writing contest. <laughs> I see what you did there. Uh, books are more than 10 bucks nowadays. Not saying you should donate anymore. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, my God. I, uh, I, what was the one book? The one book I picked up that's a mass market paperback. Oh, I lied. This one's seven. Not, I, th I thought it was seventeen ninety. It was seven ninety nine. So yes, it buys more than half of a book, David. Um, also, reading Rainbow Bro was in chat, and he said that this book has beautiful prose and is really good. So very excited about it. this. Might be one I, f I fit in early in in the year. I love um, it when you find one that no one's ever talked about, and you're like, I hope this is. Good. Yeah, you know, I'll be honest with you. The cover has um, mm -hmm. kind of like a Cal Drogo looking dude with two kids on a horse. And mm -hmm. that immediately piqued my interest because I love Cal Drogo. And Nayor from Prince of Nothing is like a better version. Or Karsa from, um, you know, Conan. Let's just say Conan. How about that? Which I also need to read. Uh, I haven't read any Conan. I know you're really you're reading Elric, which is like, yeah. a, you know, a very influential work. How, how are you liking it? I like it, but I don't love it. So I enjoy it. Um, and I appreciate it for lots of reasons, but the style is just not my favorite. The, like the prose is really nice. I think it's written really well. It's just <sighs> authors sometimes, and this is one of the problems I had originally when I read the green bone saga, there is this technique that authors use sometimes where they're, they narrate their characters thoughts to you. And that is how you glean information about their motivations. Okay. So when people love Fonda Lee's characters, I understand why, because they are really three dimensional characters. I think she does a great job developing them. I think that they're excellent. You become many people become really attached to them over the course of the series. I don't like getting to know someone by someone telling me what they're thinking, like having this like running monologue, hmm. like I am going to do this because this is my motivation and I need to do it. And maybe it's just because I don't experience thoughts like that. Like my, I don't have this like running checklist of what I need to do in sequence in order to like live my day-to-day -day life. But that also happens in Elric sometimes. And when I pointed it out, Kyle makes fun of me for this a lot. Like when he sees it in a book now, he's like, well, I know that Sarah will hate this because this is the thing that she doesn't like, but it bothers me. Like I like characters hmm. being developed in different ways. Yeah. And you know, what's funny about this is that uh, I can't remember the book I was reading, but their thoughts were, you know, italicized and they were thinking things. And I found myself bouncing off of it a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, I would say I like reflective things, but uh, a really good example of it's Farseer where Fitz reflects on things, but he's writing it as a chronicling of, of what he went through, right? He's yes. writing the history. Black Company's written also this way. 
So inner thoughts or foresight to events that might come don't feel for, for some reason, it doesn't feel as ham fisted, but I do find whenever like a book ha is really heavy in the, you know, monologue in the brain, it's all italicized for some reason. I, I'm not gonna say I dislike it because I've definitely had it happen where I enjoy it, mm -hmm. but man, I, I'm kind of with you on that. I, I think, I think I we're on the same page. I do not enjoy it. it is a writing technique that I do not like. And yeah, it, it, when I, when it happens, I like instantly notice it, but I don't think it's something that bothers a ton of people. <laughs> so then I end up having weird opinions about certain books, but I did like Jade legacy. So that kind of redeemed the, the series for me. Did it live up to the hype? Jay likes it. I thought it did. So I I went in and I went in expecting it not like expecting not to like it. There's no italics, Charmy. No, there's no like it's not like that. Like it's not like a running stream okay. of consciousness for okay. for Greenbone. It's more just like the way that they understand and rationalize their own thinking. People don't do that. I talk to people all the time. It's very difficult to get people to understand why they do the things that they do. It's something that people need help with. It takes years in order for them to figure out like, this is my pattern and this is why I'm doing it. So when people seem preternaturally aware of themselves and why they are doing things that they are doing, it doesn't feel right to me. Mm -hmm. And I find that that happens in books sometimes because the author wants us to know why their characters are doing the things that they are doing. And that's an easy way to tell us, you know, if they, if yeah. they recognize why they're doing this, then we as a reader can also recognize why they are doing it. But yeah. Jade legacy did live up to the hype for me. That's I was awesome. not expecting to like it at all. I didn't feel super connected to any of the characters, but then I ended up loving it. And I think it might be because I like that legacy style. And I was trying to ask Alan, how i don't understand why you do the things you do um like what you would call that because i do want to put together a video about my favorite series that span decades because Generational. i really like that i yeah. love i love the long price quartet i loved it in jade legacy but I also love it in like Dresden and Dresden's not generational because it's just him. Right. I guess you could call it generational because it is like it crosses a series of decades, but it's it's just about his life as opposed to like him hmm. and his and you know his ancestors or his offspring or whatever yeah. could could pop up out of out of that but that's just dresden over you know a span of 20 years but but i like it well i would say dandelion dynasty is a generational epic um in some ways the song of ice fire is also a generational epic because we we see uh, big changes in the political landscape and also within major families um, and I would agree with you, actually, I think generational epics are really fascinating and I think it's a really hard thing to do. Well, um, it's one of the reasons why I really liked the dandelion dynasty, um, a journey for the pages says you're both saying you don't like inner monologue, but at the start of the stream, you both gushed about first of all, I actually said, I'm not going to say I don't like it because I said I have liked it before. I'm just saying that recently I found myself that there are times where I'm bouncing off. So I actually did not say I didn't like it. What I find different about first law. So if we take a character say shivers okay if you think about what you know about shivers if i think about what i know about shivers over like the books that i have read i can speculate on why he does certain things that he does but he has never told me why he's doing them he does stuff and he thinks about things and you you know you you do get some understanding of people's inner monologue and then basically saying like shit fuck this is horrible like why am i doing this i need to stop doing this to myself but it's never like i am doing this because i am this sort of person and these four things happened to me when i was a child and this led me to think in this way and henceforth i do hmm. this so it's like it's less about an internal monologue which i think abercrombie does really well and more about like an internal understanding of yourself as mm -hmm. a person i'm not saying that nobody understands themselves I clearly ha like have a very biased sample size here because many of the people that I see every day have little insight into themselves. And that's why they are seeing me is because they want to help with that. But it, it doesn't always ring true when people understand their own motivation so well. Like we as people react to things so often and we're not sure until after the fact why we did it. And it takes time for us to kind of sit and reflect on why we do the things that we do. And if we do have a good sense of ourselves and the people around us, then we can 
work through it. But if we automatically understood why we did things, we wouldn't do them. Like we wouldn't hmm. do things that hurt other people or had poor consequences because, you know, we would automatically understand. Yeah. Yeah. I, that That's a pretty good way of separating those things. And, and it's like anything, uh, you know, it could be done well. Um, and I wouldn't even say done well or not done well, because it's really just a subjective personal taste time type of thing for me. Um, I just noticed there, and I can't remember what book it was recently, but like there was an inner monologue and I was like, I just feel like this is just exposition. Like this is just, uh, uh you know, I got to get this out here and I need you to know why this is here, which, you know, whatever that has to happen at some point. Um, but I bounced off of it just a little bit. Um, I also think that, uh, when we talk about generational stuff, I was thinking about it. I, I definitely think Realm of the Elderlings also falls underneath that for sure. Um, I like this question. Pat, what's up, man? He says, Sarah and Jimmy, what are your highest priority series to read in 2023? I would say mine is probably um, probably Long Price Quartet. I think that's the one I'm most excited to see how I land with. What about you? Uh, the ones that are highest priority to finish would be Dagger and Coin. So I want to finish that series. And I want to do the next Realm of the Elderlings trilogy. So that is high priority. I want to continue in Lawson. So I'm going to continue on. I'm going to aim for a book every couple of months there, unless I really start to get sucked in. And then a series that I have not started that I really want to is Broken Earth. So I have not read anything by N.K. Jemison ever. Well, when you complete that, let me know. I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, even if we don't do a stream, I just would love to hear your raw reactions to that. Um, I have a... <laughs> I have a big suspicion you're going to like it, but yeah. I could be wrong. It's it's definitely a polarizing series. Uh, Greg says, hey, from town, Sarah. Hey. And Jay says, Dresden is indeed awesome. Colton says, you know what else lived up to the hype for Sarah Dresden files? Jimmy asks Sarah, is Changes still her favorite book of the year? Changes is definitely in contention. So okay. It, okay. it will, if not my book of the year, it will be one of them. Yes, you enjoyed it. I did. I did. And I did not think it was possible for it to live up to the hype. But for me, it did. But I had a turning point at Deadbeat that you have not had yet. So I don't know if it will be the same for you. But I, I did not think there was any way in the world for changes to live up to the hype that people had given it. And it did. Nice. Nice. Yeah, Deadbeat, I would say, you know, and I still have 100 pages to go. Who knows what could happen? Um, I've been enjoying it just about as much as Summer Night and Deathmatch, which is to say that I'm enjoying it, right? Nothing crazy, uh, not making me feel like I got to pick up the next one. Um, I already have the next one because I ordered them in like batches from Book Depository. So I feel like I'll probably read the next one relatively soon just because I have it. But then might be the time where I take like a pretty long break in between, uh, depending on how it's landing with me. Uh, Carol Orlong says... A song of ice fire has no choice but to be generational if we focus on one generation it would be a short story which george is great at his short stories are great i uh it's not a short story but i read, read uh the dying of the light this month and was a really big fan of its sci-fi story uh kind of a romance almost in a way and it was really good i really enjoyed it oh pat says thanks for sharing my lazen is my number one priority and i still don't know if i end up liking it uh just enjoy it you know i think uh as long as you uh I don't know. Who knows? Maybe, maybe, maybe you'll love it. Uh, Rob, Robbie says a Stephen King hot take. I think we know yours. Mine that I like the talisman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I also really like um, the girl who loved Tom Gordon, which is not a super popular one of his. Uh, what other Stephen King hot takes do I have? I don't know. I hate the same things everybody else does. Like I don't like Dreamcatcher. Does anyone? Dreamcatcher. <laughs> <laughs> I think Stephen King writes good endings. There we go. That's my Stephen King hot take. That's the hottest of endings. I love them. There have been very few that I have disliked, and most of them I really enjoy. Uh, I feel like I haven't read enough of his books to say this, but I'm going to say it anyways because it's the internet and you can't stop me. Uh, I would say that the uh, trope of Stephen King cannot write endings is way overstated, and I actually think Pet Cemetery has a phenomenal ending. And I guess the hot take specifically is I actually don't dislike the stand ending or the dark tower ending, which, you know, is, you know, uh, I, I know if Patrick hates the stand ending, Oh my gosh, I, I wouldn't say like, I loved it, but I definitely didn't like hate it nearly as much as other people. And I, I mean, I enjoyed it. I'd like the stand. I think it's great. Yeah, me too. Agreed. Just wait till I get the changes. <laughs> Just wait. My God. I, uh, I I will get there. I, I didn't realize how close I was 
to two changes because I think I'm what four books away at this point. Yeah, only four. Are you? Yeah, only 10, four. 11, 12. Do they stay relatively short? I know. I think Battleground and Peace Talks were pretty thick, but are they, they get all... a little bit bigger? They do get a little bigger. That's unfortunate. Like they the... still go like they clip along. They don't feel any longer. Like I, I don't imagine you'll go in and be like, "Oh, this is dragging." Like it's you know they stay the their pa- the pacing stays the same. Yeah, uh, Kevin I haven't read Under the Dome. I have it though, so maybe I should make that one of my high priority Stephen Kings for next year. Well, it's like a thousand pages, so good luck. It's <laughs> so big, and and I love the uh, the premise of it, like the whole idea mm-hmm. behind it. I think is dope. I haven't read it yet, um, and I know that that ending is also very. <laughs> is that another one? that they changed from like the adaptation you don't love dream alan catcher. likes dream alan. catcher no, no you don't i'm going to goodreads right now there's no way on this earth that you love dream this is a lie and if it is a lie then i'm right and you're a liar oh my goodness uh david sloan says 11 top 10 ending of all time i love the ending I, that's a great book a journey for the pages says talking about Stephen King. Have either of you read Rage? I don't know whether I want to try and find it. I, I have not, but I will. I have not read Rage. My used bookstore had a hardcover of it for a Sorry, long time. Was the worst. Sorry, I do I'm not hate it now. Who said Jamie, I hated it? No, this no, is, I love it. Okay, Tanner's Thank working God. on getting banned for for <laughs> slander or libel. Which one is it? Uh. K says revival has an amazing ending. Revival is probably the King book that isn't like super duper popular that I'm most excited to read. I think I'll probably read shining and Dr. Sleep next and then revival most likely. All right. Alan's 603 books, his red books. Let's see. He hasn't read 603 books. He's a liar. No, those that that's all of his books. He's only read 187. I, on I, good reads that I'm he still, has still blocked. questioning that. <laughs> let's sort these by title. There's no way. There's no way that Alan loves Dreamcatcher. I refuse to accept it. The movie also has Jason Lee, Timothy uh, Oliphant, Damian Lewis, and Morgan Freeman. So good. I, so I've seen the movie, and I liked the movie back in the day, but I have not read Dreamcatcher the book. I do know. I think it's uh, Brian from my Discord said it's like one of the worst books he's ever read. Right. <laughs> I, I've not heard many positive things. Dreamcatcher is not on your Goodreads, Alan. If you loved it, you would have a review of it. I think he just likes the movie. I think he's trolling. Get out of here. Oh, Alan doesn't have the king on Goodreads. So maybe he is abstaining from uh, ra- uh, rating some Stephen King. No. Is this possible? I don't know. I don't know. No. I I feel like <laughs> Alan just likes the Dreamcatcher movie. I think I think that's where where we've we've decided um pat says the shining is one of the greatest of all times and i thought dr sleep was a solid sequel certainly bold of king to even try my dad uh liked dr sleep a good amount he said he'd actually had no idea that it tied into the shining (laughs) and he was like oh wow like he thought he figured it you know he's like oh did you know this and i'm like yeah yeah um and he actually bought it for me too so i gotta get through those at some point you have you read the shining i haven't so i have avoided the like what king's scariest books are supposed to be I actually hmm. just read Pet Cemetery for the first time a couple of years ago, and it did, in fact, scare me. Well, Alan says, I don't have a ton of King I've read on Goodreads. I read all this crap before the Internet bros. <laughs> what is one book that Alan has um, has wanted you to read that you're going to get to next year? Uh, for me, it's Long Price Quartet, but I've actually listen. Alan says no one reads his stuff, but I've read uh, KJ Parker. I read Augusta. Now, you know, <laughs> they didn't go swimming. I liked the company. You know, I, I liked it just fine. But, you know, they weren't massive hits. I read Black Company and loved it, which Alan loves the Black Company. And I'm reading Long Price Quartet next year. So I don't know what he's talking about. I read Guns of the Dawn. That was excellent. Oh, was it good? Yeah. Yeah, hmm. it was really good. Interesting. Um, What do I want to read? Blackwing? Is that the name of it? The one that he compared to the Gunslinger? Yes, Ed McDonald. And that one I actually got out of the uh, Sisterhood of the Traveling Book Box with uh, Finney Reads. Uh, I was a part of that. And uh, Kate from the Apothec- uh, Literary Apothecary, I believe, and mm-hmm. a bunch of people. And that was uh, one I picked out of that box pretty much immediately because Alan praised Blackwing a ton. And I think he even like personally reached out and was like, you'll love this. So I'd like to squeeze that in. But it's three books as well. So I got to figure out when I can fit it in. D- 
Alan, I do not hate everything you like. That is literally not true. I loved I loved Black Company book one, probably more than most people did. Because uh, every time I see anyone talk about Black Company, it's how much they don't like it. <laughs> yep. People are trying to sow a feud between me and Alan in the chat. But what's one that he's recommended to you that next year you'd like? Uh, so Blackwing, we have that. Is there any others? Blackwing will be one. What else has Alan recommended that I want to read? I've read like basically everything he's ever told me to read. He hasn't recommended a book to me that I haven't read. Now, has he ever read anything that you've recommended to him? Never. Not one time in his whole Interesting, life. Interesting, because I also recommend books to Alan, and he also doesn't read them. Mm-hmm. And he'll say the God is not willing is on that list, but he's the one who proposed that we read that. Actually, I was going to take a while before I read it. And Alan said, Hey, we'll do it. And I read it. And then he took nine months to read it. Thanks. Yep, ridiculous. That sounds like Alan. <laughs> Sarah also <laughs> nurtures hate towards me. You've never recommended me once recommend a book to Alan right now. I've recommended so many books to you, Alan swords point. I recommended, what else did I recommend to you? Nation by Terry Pratchett, a Terry Pratchett book you have not read that I have read. Fake fan confirmed. I also read Reaper Man this month. I read Reaper Man. Like, nice. come on. It's a step up from Mort, right? Maybe that's my Discworld hot take. <gasps> you don't think so? I liked it. I liked it a lot. Um, and there are things that I liked more about it. But I think I like the story of Mort more, actually. And, and, and I can only go off like my raw reaction to it is just like I remember reading Mort and being like, I love this. Uh, and I still really loved Reaper Man, but mm -hmm. I definitely enjoyed <laughs> I definitely enjoyed Mort just a little bit more, which I think I'm I've never heard anyone else say that. Uh, and Alan is now saying that. <laughs> oh, he likes Mort better, too. OK. There we go. My unpopular death series opinion is that soul music. The third one is my favorite, which I think is a lot of people's least favorite, mm. but I, it makes, it made me laugh so much. I, I love it. And it introduces like two of my favorite characters. Well, I have it in the mail coming from book depository along with guards, guards. I'm finally, I'm going to read guards, guards, and then go to soul music. That's what I'm going to read next year. Yes. That's going to be my next disc world book. So I have finished the death ones and I'm going to go on to the city watch series now. Nice. So you've read all of the death books. Okay. Um, yeah. And and at the end of it, soul music was your favorite because there's five, right? There, there are five. I think they get better as they go. So I like the fifth one is probably, in my opinion, the best one. Right. See, Alan. <laughs> I love soul music too, Derry. And Alan didn't like the fifth one a lot either. I don't think because of the time monks. The Hogfather is great, and I read it at Christmas time last year, which was the best. I read it, and then I watched the adaptation. And the adaptation, if you like Doctor Who and that like cheesy BBC kind of like sci-fi fantasy feel, you would love the Hogfather adaptation. It's excellent. It is almost word for word from the book, and it's just it's so good. But you have to like that kind of like campy adaptation. But if you do, then then it's great. I agree, Alan. It is a great adaptation. I have never watched Doctor Who and I don't have a lot of interest in Doctor Who. And that makes me a little nervous, but I'm definitely going to try it. At you some don't point have to like Doctor Who. So they're not similar in content. It's just style. The like approach. when you look at the, like the props and the setup and kind of the British type humor, it rings similar because the adaptation is very unlike an American or North American Christmas movie. It doesn't okay. feel like that at all, but it's, it's excellent. All right. I'll give it a shot. I will. Um, I'm going to read guards guards before I continue the death. Uh, series. Cause I just want to see what else that Discworld has to offer. Um, I was going to read a standalone. Uh, I was going to read small gods, but then Alan told me not to. And I listened to him. Wow. you listened to Alan. I mean, I he, it's, as it's I all... always do. Uh, and I will say this. I did tell Alan to read Stoner. And, and I'm actually pretty um, conservative when it comes to recommending stuff to Alan. Because if I mention it, I know he won't read it. So I, when I when I told him Stoner, I was like, listen, man. The kiss like, of death. Like, I know you're not. Like, I know you're going to immediately go, well, I'm never going to read this. But I'm like, you have to read this book. Like, this is, this is a book that could be important to you. And I was right. So I'm batting 1000 over here. Like I'm, I haven't missed with Alan yet. Now it's only a one for one, but you know, Alan's recommendations are all over the place for me. I mean, maybe he's batting 500. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs>
<laughs> oh man. Where did you watch the monster anime, Jimmy? A completely legal way on YouTube that okay. uh, may or may not have been removed for being illegal. And then I got stuck and I said, well, I guess I'm ordering all the manga. And that's what happened. <laughs> okay. Cause I like, I couldn't find it. So I was like, I would like to watch it too, but I mm -hmm. didn't know where to get it. So maybe it's just one of those things that you have to hunt down if you would like to partake in it. Yes, I I did hear that Netflix has signed a deal with the people who actually produce the anime. So there is a chance that that and other stuff might become the Netflix in the coming years. So that will be a uh, thing I look out for because I loved the anime. I actually thought it was great. I, and I was listening to the dub, which I know is like heresy, but like I thought it was really good. Speaking of dub, I know you don't watch a lot of television, but have you seen this Netflix show called 1899? Mm -mm, but I have seen people talk about it a lot. Yeah, I don't know how to feel about this show. So I watched it all and I liked it. And it's a good it's a good television show. But mm -hmm. like I was kind of expecting more from it. But like I, I got how about this? I really want to watch a season two now because it's so insanely out there. Mm -hmm. But I feel I'm so nervous because it gives me Westworld vibes. And I love Westworld season one. And I'm mm -hmm. terrified that that this show is just going to go off the rails in season two, like Westworld did for me. Is that what happened with Westworld? It, it, well, for me, for me, I thought season two was just like, it, it was rough. It, it was rough for me. Uh, and then I hated, I think season three is when I, I quit that show. Um, right. But I wasn't sure if you'd watched it. Cause it is bizarre and it has um, multiple languages. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a pretty interesting show though. Interesting. Yeah. The only thing I'm watching right now is I'm watching spy family, which is an anime about a, spy who has a mission and penny's reading the manga he has a mission that he needs to carry out and for this mission he needs to have a family so he adopts a fake daughter and then gains a fake wife and as they're living their like life together he obviously starts to develop real connections with them and it's Ooh. really funny and really cute um so i'm watching that that's one that like is coming out weekly um and i'm watching petra just posted about this on Instagram the other day, so you, you may have noticed it. There's another anime that just started recently called Blue Lock. It's a sports anime about soccer, and it is bananas. It is off the wall, <laughs> like actually one of the most ridiculous things that I've ever watched. And originally, I'd asked my husband, Andrew, to watch it, and he doesn't like sports anime. He likes anime, but he doesn't like sports anime. And he was like, I don't think I'm going to watch it. But we watched the first one after an episode of spy family and because it was so like out there he was like well now i have to watch it i don't even think i like it but i need to watch it but the concept is that in order to raise japan's like standings at the world level in soccer they need to create the perfect striker and so what they do is set up this like Hunger Games style competition where they invite the most promising strikers in the country to train at this facility. And if you get knocked out of their training games, you can never play soccer again. So you can never play professional soccer and only one person will be kind of molded into this like ultimate player for Japan. And it is, like I said, it's off the walls. Like it is absolutely over the top ridiculous. But I can't stop watching it. It sounds so, ridiculous. It is ridiculous. And I like have hooked Andrew in now because he's like, I don't want to like this, but I can't stop watching it. What service is this on? This is on Crunchyroll, I think. Or I don't know if we're watching yeah. on Crunchyroll or Funimation. I'll ask him. I'm very curious. Andy, are we watching Blue Lock on Crunchyroll or Funimation? We're watching it on Crunchyroll. Okay, good to know. I might I might give it a shot because I just like out, out of this world stuff. I mean, that sounds pretty wacky. Um, Faisal says, Sarah, you should watch uh, March Comes In Like a Lion, one of my all-time favorite animes. I may. How long is it? So this is my one, like, this is my one question because I have not watched One Piece, which is like the one thing that everybody loves because it's 10 billion episodes long. I'm trying to get the box set for the manga, the first one, but it's like it's sold out everywhere. It's so hard to get. And I want the box set because I've never got a box of it. I've, I've always wanted a box set of uh, manga. It just looks like a kid's thing. I, I don't know. I want it. Uh, David Sloan says, Jimmy, you literally say you read so much because you don't do anything else, but you've watched every TV show ever produced. This is not this is like categorically false. Like this is not true. <laughs> I, what I do is I watch about three to four shows a year, and then I usually have really bad opinions on those shows, 
and then I share them and then people tell me I'm dumb and then I go, okay. And then that, that, that's kind of the cycle. These things go. I, I watched Severance this year. I watched House of the Dragon and I watched 1899 and I unfortunately watched The Midnight Club, which was terrible. Um, oh my God, I hated that show. I was so mad. I wasted it. I wasted my time. I DNF'd it on like the last episode. I was like, I literally don't care what happens and I'm done with it. And I feel better now getting that off my chest because I don't think I've said that on the podcast yet, but yeah. Hated the Midnight Club, which sucks because the Flanagans have done such good horror every year. Uh, Haunting of Hill House, all these things. I, you know, I thought that Midnight Mass was one of the best shows I've ever watched. And then they released that absolute pile of dog shit called the Midnight Club. And I hate it. <laughs> absolute pile of dog shit. I love it. It looks like this anime is 44 episodes ish. I will watch it. Um, and it sounds like if you want a short one, you could watch The Land of the Lustrious. I think it's Lustrious, hopefully. Interesting. You should, I would. I, Everyone's telling me to try Andor. Everyone's talking about Andor. So I had Andrew had given up on Star Wars shows and has been trying to hold fast on that. But if he watches Andor, then I will I will watch it with him. Apparently it's phenomenal. Um I will watch it, but I have other stuff I gotta finish first. I gotta finish the session and Better Call Saul. Once I have those out of the way, and uh I still haven't watched last season of The Expanse, which I loved. I don't want it to be over. <laughs> and I've been kind of catching up with the book, so I kinda actually want to finish the books and then watch the last season, like mm -hmm. just to see what the difference is. But um, I don't know when I'll get to that. But like I said, I'm terrible watching television. Um, Severance is tied with House of the Dragon. It's my favorite show this year, but I've only watched four shows. So what, what the hell do I really know? Um, I may watch House of the Dragon. That's something that I might end up watching. I'm a fan. Oh, yeah. <laughs> really? You liked it? I, I liked it just a little bit. I may have I may have covered it every single week it was on. Just a tiny. I did see it. And that's the sad part is like not being able to watch what people were saying about it because I was yes. not watching it. And I cared enough that I didn't want to spoil it. Yes. Even though I it took me years to watch Game of Thrones. Yeah, I mean, uh that that's how I a lot of my friends were like that with the original show. Um, but every single one of them were on board for House of the Dragon. Like it felt like a thing. It was very fun. I had a lot of fun. Uh, some of the discourse fun. was not as fun, but um, I do. Is. Yeah, I do bend the knee, right? Which is uh, a song of ice and fire podcast. My friend, Matt, and I just mm -hmm. took, I just took over co-host uh, role with that for my friend Ezra. And we get a very different audience there. Like this audience is the reading audience. They pick up on a lot of subtleties. Like I've actually had really positive interactions. We get a little more of the casual audience over on bend the knee. And at times, it veered into the ridiculousness oh, yeah. of the internet. And I didn't, um, you know, those were some of the harder weeks, <laughs> uh, but overall I'm very happy with the show. I don't think it's perfect, um, but it's fantastic. Like it was still an excellent thing. It was an epic uh, production and the score was pff, stupid. Good. You know what I will watch when it comes out as it's released? What? The last of us. Yes. I will yeah. because I saw well I've I've watched Andrew play through both games a couple of times. So I know the story and I like the story, but I saw the trailer and it has such western vibes in the trailer. I was like I need to watch this. I am yeah. going to watch it. If it's HBO, I'll watch it. Uh that that's another thing like if something's on HBO it immediately gets put over almost anything else uh just cuz I'm a fanboy and but I am pissed I'm a little pissed off that they turned down Monster. Like that bothers say, me. Yeah, that kind of bothers me, uh, to be honest. It's probably because they were like manga, nah, which which is you know a bias that Western companies seem to have for whatever reason. It's very very annoying. Um, David Sloan asked, "Do you have any literary authors in mind after McCarthy, Jimmy?" Yes, Faulkner, which I'm not as convinced I'm going to like, but Faulkner had a huge impact on George R. R. Martin and his writing style and the way that he approaches stories. So I feel like it would be uh, dumb of me not to. Um, to read some of uh, Faulkner's work. And then like, I, I would like to continue reading Le Guin, uh, which I do count as literary authors. You know, I think uh, that Le Guin is one of the most, you know, important people in the genre, but also extends far beyond it. And uh, I want to read her sci-fi. So definitely want to do that. And I think I have like two or three more things in earth sea to read. I've read three of them, but there's a short story collection. I think two or three more novels. So definitely be doing her as well. Murakami, so you asked me earlier about rereading books. So mm -hmm. I read Norwegian Wood by Murakami years and years and years ago, and I loved it. I still think about it all the time. I think about lines from it, like specifically the writing in it. And it has this really nostalgic feeling that I really like and that gets me like no matter what I'm reading, like it was the same feeling I got reading Boy's Life. Like there's just sometimes that nostalgia hits you and stays with you. 
But then Bookborn and Leanna read it and hated it, like absolutely despised it. And I was like, if I went back and read it, would well, I just like it now? Wait, Leanna hates everything. True, but Bookborn doesn't. No, that's true. But she has very shit. Well, yeah, that's fair. I, I That's fair. If it was no, just I Leanna, I would just say it's fine. Like, don't worry about it. That's true. But I, uh, so I don't know. I, I really, really loved it. And I have other books by Murakami that I need to read. I have only read The Sound and the Fury by Faulkner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I hate everything. Every, everyone has told me to read As I Lay Dying, which someone actually also mentioned here. Uh, Fasail says, you plan on reading any, uh, I'm going to mess this up. Fyodor Dos. I'm not even going to say it. I'm sorry. I'm dumb. And, and my, my friend Nick is Russian and I know it's just going to, he's going to be like, I, I hate you. So am I going to read this author? Uh, yeah, probably at some point. It's not like high on the TBR though, but yeah, I, I definitely will because uh, that's crime and punishment. I think, is that right? And the, yeah. and the idiot, is that what it's called? It's like the gambler, the idiot and crime and punishment and the brothers, something um, that I, that I've have on my TBR from him. Uh, but I don't know when I will get to that. Um, Sad Russian novels for sad sad literary people have you ever seen that tiktok i don't even have tiktok but i just know that this came from there it is called like sad beige clothes for sad beige children and it talks about how people my wife like, told me about this <laughs> wealthy people dress their children in these like really muted colors and then take these artistic photos of them looking miserable and there's like someone has done like this voiceover talking about sad beige clothes for sad beige children and so when i think of dostoevsky i think of sad beige Russian literature for sad beige readers. Just like <laughs> bleak and sad. Penny says, I am not sad. <laughs> I haven't read any. I've only read Tolstoy of the... Well, that's not true because I read Nabokov. I read Lolita, but I have not read. That's it. Well, people are saying The Idiot is the perfect book for me to read. <laughs> um, das... To now, see, I can't do this. I can't... You know, it's funny. I actually don't like reading aloud and I do it all the time here. And, and I, I, I really, I actually don't enjoy doing it. Um, we do a, book, a technical book club at work and we have to read the chapters out loud every week. And I mm -hmm. never volunteer because I'm like, I don't want to read this. Do you want to feel a lot better about yourself? Yes, always. Okay. So, you know, the word raucous, like, you know, a, a rumpus, like a big, a yeah. like, lot of noise. My entire life. Until I listened to an audiobook, and I can't remember which audiobook it was. I thought the word vacuous was vacuous, like rhymes with raucous. Like I thought that is what the word was. So like I thought if you were like an empty headed person, you it was vacuous. And then I heard it in an audiobook and it was vacuous. I was like, is there an entire letter in this word that I have missed for 30 plus years of life? And then I pulled it up and read it. And I was like, holy shit. Like, I didn't even know how to spell this. It was so there you go. Listen, I had this exact same thing happen, except with the movie. Um, and I got to look it up before I say it, because I'm tired of people making fun of me for it. I think it's Memento. And I called it Momento. I thought it was Momento for 20 years. And it's <laughs> Memento. Yeah. Yeah, it's Memento. Yeah, and that happened on the podcast, and the chat was just like, you're an idiot. <laughs> right. How dumb are you? If you've even seen the movie, and I'm like, oh, my God. Uh, oh, Scarecrow says, hi, guys. What's your favorite fantasy character of all time? Or would you talk about them in a non-spoiler manner? Explain why you love them. Mine is Fitz Chivalry Tharseer. He is my favorite character of all time because uh, I think he is a lovable idiot, and he also goes through... Um, some things that I am able to relate to in the way that that character ends up processing guilt over a very long period of time. Um, even also processing trauma that is put onto him by people that are supposed to take care of him. Uh, those kind of things. I like those themes and I think it's handled really well in realm of the outer links. What about you, Sarah? I'm pretty sure when I did my favorite character video, Fitz was also my top, but I'll talk about a different person because we can't both talk about the same person. <laughs> Let's see. Who's another fantasy character that I love? Uh, a classic love would be Lyra from His Dark Materials. So that was, I read that at a formative time. I read it when I was also a young girl. And I like a good, like, mischievous, but 
compassionate, kind of like loyal, truth seeking protagonist. So nice. I love Lyra for that reason. I think she's she is definitely my favorite like young protagonist in fantasy. I do love Fitz. I think Fitz is excellent, but I also love Lyra. Nice. I'll be reading his Dark Materials for the first time next year. And it's interesting. I never know. It's it's one of those series that I never know if if people are going to like it because I read it so young that it was cemented in there as something that I love. And it's really hard when you like something that much to know Mm -hmm. objectively if it is good or not good. There's a lot of really cool ideas, but what seemed like really revolutionary as a 12 year old is probably not the same when you're in your thirties, but at the very least, it's a cool, it's a cool series. Hopefully you will like it. I think it's harder maybe to fall in love with it when you're older, but I think you'll like it. Yeah. Um, We'll see. I, I think I, I, I'm going into it with uh, the right mindset of knowing that and uh, that a lot of people read it when they were younger and, and I'm not. So I think it'll be OK. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, I don't know much about it. That's a nice thing. Like I don't know spoilers at all, really. I watched the first season of the television show, but I don't remember anything other than there was a bear. And a lot of people from Game of Thrones show was in it. And that's why I watched <laughs> it, to be honest. <laughs> and it was really good. I really enjoyed this first season. Um, there's also like a wacky uncle. Yeah. That's all I remember, really. Uh, so hopefully I enjoy it. I'll probably read that somewhere uh, towards the beginning of the year. They're, they're not terribly long. And then I know there's some sequels, but I've heard mixed things about the sequels. I have also heard mixed things. I have not read them. I own them. And my dad keeps like saying, Sarah, you haven't read them yet because he wants me to read them so that he can talk to me about them. And I've been putting it off because I love his dark material so much that I don't want to feel negatively about mm-hmm. the sequels. But yeah that's fair there's always trepidation when it comes to you know old favorites and like you said like not knowing and 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 frankly whenever there's something that i liked and it was a a before time right before maybe i'd read a bunch of books Mm -hmm. i just don't i guess i just stopped caring whether or not i was right or wrong and i just know that that experience lives uh, you know true to me in 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 the history of of me as a reader and that just is what it is you know i I constantly think about going back in Goodreads and like adjusting ratings and stuff, but like I don't put a lot of stock in the star ratings anyways, because like I just, I think about it for about a second and then I hit the button and I move on most of the time. Sometimes I'll come back if I feel like I didn't do it justice. Like it's almost always to raise it very rarely. I have thought about going back to Emperor's Blades and giving it two stars because I gave it 2.5. I gave it (laughs) 2.5 and rounded the three because I was round up because, you know, I'm, Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm a good person, uh, <laughs> but I should have probably given it two or one, like just for how much I disliked it. But it is what it is. I mean, a one star book to me, it just is just me, but it has to be like truly Trash. like, yeah. I like, did this recently, like went back through Goodreads to see which books I had given a one star rating because I don't, I don't give a lot of one stars. and I don't do a lot of rant reviews. I've written two rant reviews on Goodreads. One of them was for this book called Wallbanger, which was like a an erotic romance. And it was truly terrible. <laughs> like t- truly like mind-bendingly awful. The woman in the book talked about her orgasm in the third person. It like it was it was so much. It was horrible. And I re- I wrote a rant review <laughs> for Dark Age yeah yeah because you're one of the few people i know that you're like kind of you're kind of off it now like with red rising the the no i still am super excited for the next book okay okay i am really excited i still love the characters i i just really didn't like dark age okay yeah because i i felt like you you had some gripes with some of the things that went down and the way it was executed right uh, yeah, and I, it's not even because it's dark because it is a, like it is a turn for the dark. Some things happened that I felt like didn't accomplish anything, and it was just like it felt like I don't want to say that anything is something because I don't know Pierce Brown. Obviously, some of it felt like it was being dark for the sake of darkness. Like, ooh, okay. look what I can write in this book. I'm gonna put this in, and it's gonna be so dark. I also thought the pacing was totally completely off which was not the case for any of the other red rising books i flew through them really quickly and there were parts of dark age that were like my favorite parts of all of red rising and i read it so quickly and then i would reach another point where it was so slow and that's what i wrote my review like i felt like i was on the world's worst literary carnival ride where i was just being like (laughs) propelled forward at like super speed and then abruptly stopped and nauseated afterwards so it's i just i I did not enjoy my time with that book 
who knows? I'll probably reread all of them before the last one comes out because I am super excited for it. It's split and now, love... though, right? Pardon? It's it, the last one's now split, though, right? Oh yeah, there's two, right? So yeah. There's two more that are coming out, but you, yeah, you probably will like it if you haven't read it. I don't know. Yeah, I haven't read the sequels. Uh, my good friend Bach actually sent me both of them, but I'm, I'm kind of waiting for it to be finished. Yeah, um, it's, it's just one of those things. Um, I, I like the first trilogy. You know, I, I can see why it's so beloved. Um. And I, I had an okay time with it, but with that said, I haven't thought much about it since I finished Absolutely. it, and I haven't had a big like push for to pick up the sequels, though I will at some point. And speaking of getting the motivation to pick something up, Sarah, when will you read Stormlight? I don't know if it'll be next year or not. It, I probably will at least read the first one. I think Stormlight will probably come closer to the end of the year next year maybe because there are other things like i definitely want to finish dagger and coin before i like crack open another long fantasy series but i will read hero of ages in december so i will have <laughs> finished mistborn i don't think i'm gonna read era 2 before i go on to read stormlight hmm. um because i just you know the opinions are so mixed and even though i really like westerns i really don't like brandon sanderson's sense of humor and everybody says that he tries to be funnier in era two, which I don't think that I will enjoy. Um, but hopefully I will like the stormlight archive. Yeah. I, 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 uh, I had a great experience with it. It's easily mm -hmm. like my favorite series from Sanderson. Mm -hmm. uh, my favorite thing I ever read was um, emperor soul. I uh, did order books two and three for the uh, era two Mistborn. alley of law was, you know, okay. Uh, for, it was okay at best for me. Um, and I will continue it don't know when it will be they're really easy to read like they're like you know you can just get through them especially on audio so it, it probably won't be shocking if i get through era two in 2023 but i i would also agree that uh the humor does not resonate with me in the least especially in that first book alloy of mid it was uh at times was very rough and me and alan actually did buddy read that one on accident we didn't know each other we both were reading it we kind of got the bounce back and forth and we pretty much had the same experience so um though i know a lot of people do like it and i know some people like era 2 even more which which is interesting i, I wouldn't say i was the biggest fan of era 1 anyways so i don't think mistborn is my favorite flavor of the cosmere i i might not actually like the cosmere i might just like stormlight <laughs> i think that might be that might be me uh but as they become more and more intertwined i do feel a pressure to to, to read these other books so i, I every time i'm like i want to love it like yeah. I try, I go in with a positive attitude. I was, I was, I was damn near positive. I was going to like Elantris. Like I was like, I'm going to read this book. I'm going to love it. I'm going to be a hipster. It's going to be dope. I'm going to be the hipster of Brandon Sanderson. I'm going to get all these views on my review. And I, I DNF'd it. I, I, I couldn't oh, do it. No. And that's just, that's just the truth. Unfortunately. So. I think Elantris is maybe the only Brandon Sanderson book my dad hasn't read. Maybe he has read it. I don't remember, but I, I'm not sure. But I really like the paperbacks of the Stormlight Archive. They're so floppy, floppy and <laughs> perfect. So, like, not to sound totally ridiculous, but that does have a big impact on reading something. Like, I love when the paperback is to my liking. I talked about this on Discord, like, maybe a month or so ago. I went to pick up the book Never Die because I wanted to read something short and I was just like, I had just finished something. I was like, I'm going to read something quick. And I think I will like never die. I was really in the mood to read it. And I picked up the book and number one, the binding was super tight. So I felt like I had to like use my like non-existent chest muscles in order to open it. And then the typesetting was really weird. Like the, the, indents i don't know the like people margins. were saying like the margins there we go people yeah. were saying like the technical terms for things in discord but like the margins were really weird the spacing like the amount of space between the chapter title and the words and i looked at it and i was like i can't i can't read this so i closed <laughs> oh, it oh no and put it down so then i felt really bad and like pulled the discord i was like am i like, is there something wrong with me? And then people were like, no, font and like layout does make a big difference. I was like, well, thank goodness. But apparently that happens more often with self-published or mm -hmm. like indie published books. So I felt like a monster. I was like, okay, I'll read all of these mainstream books with their like fancy printing because people can afford to make them. This poor person who actually needs me to read his book and review it, I'm not going to 
not going to do it. And then I felt bad and I was like, you know what? I'll, I'll read it at some point, but I just couldn't handle it. Sarah hates self pub. Confirmed. Confirmed. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, everyone loves Felf Pub so much. We do need that counter. You know, it's 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 like SeaWorld. Everyone hates SeaWorld. Sarah loves SeaWorld. <laughs> we're learning. We're she, learning hates of things tonight. <laughs> she hates orcas. She hates orcas. Richard Nell, uh, Kings of Paradise, has a different type of it's self pub, and also has a very different font. And I don't know if you guys can. Nah, there's no way. So it, it is. Um, the the font's big, which for my eyes, I love. Mm -hmm. um, but I have had people comment on that review I did of that book, and they said that they did not like the font. But I actually did, and it is not typical of a, of a published book. Uh, but I actually enjoyed it. So um, I think you're just a hater at this point. I am. Like Alan <laughs> said, a snob. A, a fantasy typeface snob. My God. Oh, I did love Sword of Kaigen, so... It just shows you that people can be pretentious about anything. True. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Well, you know what I'm thinking about before I came on here, Jimmy? It's like, what? you know what we should have done? Because when I think of our friendship now, I think of the, the charity Jeopardy. And I was like, we should have organized something for Christmas as like a small fundraiser type thing. And it should have been like dumbest booktube trivia. Like, for example, how many times in a single video does Alan reference the people he hates? Or <laughs> like just like the most off the wall booktube trivia that no yes. one will get right. Yes. And then obviously we need to find a winner amongst people. That that should have been tonight's episode of Chatting with Nuts. We should have invited multiple people. We should have been done organizing it. World's dumbest booktube trivia. Could have been like pub trivia. People in the chat could have popped in. It would have been would have been excellent. Yeah, I, I got to say uh, the Jeopardy that we did was one of, if not the one of my, it's probably my favorite thing I've done on BookTube, actually, uh, which is funny because it wasn't even on my channel. But okay. us pulling that together, having that idea, and it being just as ridiculous as we wanted it to be, and having people jumping in at time schedules and everyone coming together, one, it shows how awesome the community is. But two, it was high octane. It was pressure was on and we were we were just ad libbing a lot of it. And uh, the videos, it just felt like something different. Mm -hmm. And uh, to this day, it's probably my favorite thing I've done. That was so much fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. It and for a good great. cause. Yes, absolutely. So it's it, trying to recapture that high, right? <laughs> yeah, I just <laughs> always try. Try. That. I mean, I that live. Out. I live for the improv and I live for the live format. It's just what I like to do. I, you know, me sitting here and mispronouncing it, you know, if I was shooting this video, I'd re I'd reshoot a hundred times, but you know, sometimes you just give up on a Russian author's name. Sometimes you just tap out <laughs> That's true. in front of 110 people. You just say, I'm too stupid to do this. I don't know why y'all listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> Someone said edgelord Jimmy better than Chad. Jimmy. Now that's a hot take. And I hadn't even seen that. So I knew I knew that I had given you very minimal direction on what to do. And I didn't know what you were going to actually come up with it. And it was it was awesome. Everyone was not mean to you, Alan. Everyone loves you, Alan. Uh, this this is intriguing. Colton says Sarah and Jimmy need to read Wistful Ascending, which I saw an ad for today on like the Internet uh, because of their love for DBZ. It is the most DBZ influenced book I've ever read. And it was awesome. I wonder if I would enjoy it because I've watched other uh, animes that are supposed to be like DBZ like with the powering up and stuff. And I have bounced off pretty hard. Mm -hmm. So I do wonder if I would enjoy it. I would try it though. Cause I do love dragon ball Z very, very much. I um, too. I wanted to ask you about solo leveling. Are you enjoying it? I like it. It, it is not like, I don't love it. For example, I have read the first four and I will probably get the fifth one for Christmas Nice, um, and I will read it, but it's not like I was expecting it to become something that I was like obsessed with and I am not at this point, but mm. I do like it. I think if it's ever animated, I will really love it because I do like that like power escalation stuff in anime yeah. format more than in written format. Like I like in terms, I haven't read that much manga because i didn't really read any until recently. I, I always preferred watching it. And I think for reading, I'm going to like stories like Monster more than the ones that are super high action. I would agree. So like I love um, Demon Slayer, the anime, and I have the volumes because it's it's a completed manga and it takes such a long time to animate them because the animation is so beautiful. 
Um, but I haven't read them yet and I'm worried about how much I might like them in written format because when it comes to like the battles, sword fights, whatever, I think I just, I just prefer it. In that yeah. You know, it's funny you say that because I've always, since I started manga in, and I feel the same way as you do. Also, uh, Mike, fit to be read. Thank you so much for the super sticker. Uh, StreamYard doesn't show it, but you can see it in the chat, and it says "for you" with some luscious locks. It's awesome. I love it. Thank you so much. It's very generous of you. Um, there are times where in fantasy books, my limited imagination and un an inability to visualize much, mm -hmm. I think, makes books like less epic to me and it bothers me so much. And this happens a lot in Stormlight uh, and actually Mistborn. I had a lot of trouble following the action scenes, not even because of like all of the mechanics that are placed in. I can follow that pretty well, but I just can't see it. And I'm like sitting there just saying, this is the time where like adaptation would be really impactful for my reading experience that I could still like the books more, but I would be aided in, in this regard. I would agree. I prefer reading to watching TV, but there are certain things, like you said, that are just easier to visualize on screen. And the yeah. music helps too. Like ep the epic music in the background is, yeah, builds it up for you. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, music changes everything. Uh, my friend Jay uh, is is reading A Song of Ice Fire for the first time, and he got to some big moments in book three. And he's like, I actually prefer, prefer these in the show. And I get it because like the music and the score, everything, you know, and it really does add to it. For me, I still prefer the book itself. Uh, but I could see why, you know, someone could be influenced to enjoy, especially if they're a visual person, enjoy all of the senses being stimulated because that show uh, they definitely got it right in those first few seasons. Uh, and you you are liking Vinland Saga, the manga. Will you watch the anime for Vinland yeah. Saga? Yeah, I will actually. Um, and in fact, I uh, might be throwing that on possibly this week uh i'm on book sorry book seven <laughs> i'm on book seven uh and i find those to be pretty easy to read i actually have really enjoyed the second arc a little bit more than the first arc even even arc. though volume four is i think one of the best things i've ever read which is i think where the first season ends i think books one through four are season one i th i think so i think you're right i might be wrong because i haven't watched it yet but i, I feel like that's what i heard yeah the first um, season is excellent and the second one comes out in january i'm so excited yeah the animation for that is really great so yeah I, I i do wish that more fantasy shows were adapted uh, adapted in um animation like i think that you could get a lot more done hopefully but they're also very expensive so hard to say i don't know sure. people don't realize how how uh, expensive mm -hmm. those shows can be that is after i watched arcane i really got this idea in my head that i wanted to see dresden animated in the same style as arcane mm -hmm. like that kind of like gritty noir like it doesn't have the same steampunky kind of vibe but i just i would like it and then james marsters could be dresden because we just need his oh voice. shit <laughs> see i think you lost everyone there and then you brought him back in with marsters i think that you you got the book nerds back on track mm -hmm. how interesting um library of alexandria says jimmy didn't you recommend villain to philip only like a hundred times but um, the key is, is that you have to have 100,000 subscribers for Philip to take you serious. <laughs> That's your your transition from 10K to 100K is when you get that one piece box set. Yeah, which only will take like three and a half years. <laughs> <laughs> Books of Bengus Khan says, I'm experiencing the opposite right now where a seeing Game of Thrones on screen is totally inhibiting my imagination visualization I would normally do. And it's hurting my reading experience. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, man. Um what I will say is there's definitely a different vibe to the Game of Thrones books. And I actually, I mean, there are some characters from the show that I do visualize, but that is one of the, I mean, I've read it so many times that I do have like a brand in my head that is not the show. Um, and as you continue, you will see where it diverges pretty greatly. And in, in, in my opinion, um, especially with a lot of the fantastical elements. 20 K Philip is different. You're damn right. You're damn right. <laughs> oh god he's not even here to defend himself anymore i know and that's my favorite time to, to dog on him honestly <laughs> it's the only time the he only gets that big check mark right. next to his name it's gonna be over it's gonna be a wrap you know what we need in the fantasy world this is a total tangent but i was just remembering from the beginning when we were talking about justice of kings mm -hmm. when i used to read a lot of like ya fantasy back i don't know 10 years ago or so there were blogs where people would write summaries of the books. And that was like the purpose of the blog. We need a booktuber whose sole purpose is to 
give you a summary of a book, like a full, like these are the twists. These are the things that you need to remember. This is what needs to happen for book two. And then you can just go and watch it. And then we will be up to date on all of the series that are coming out. Someone needs to take on this mantle. I mean, honestly, that is a really great idea. Um, one of the reasons why Daniel Green became so popular on BookTube early on is because he did full summaries for the Wheel of Time. Wow. Because I would watch them. At, yeah, well, I would watch them after I'd finish a book just to make sure I got all the details. And they were very helpful. And those are, you know, that was probably, I would say he rode that to 50,000 probably or 75,000 subs. So yeah. if you're out there and you think about making a channel and you want to stand out, I think doing summaries would be a great idea. Absolute phenomenal idea. Um, it just depends on the series, right? If I made them for Aspect Emperor, I think 10 people would watch them. But man, <laughs> those it would be 10 fun. 10 people would love you. <laughs> they would. Appreciation would have for you that that was my intention with my discussions around malazan if you watch my memories of ice review it's really me recapping the book and my reactions to it. it's very much a reaction so not so much a review um but my god they were so hard to make i mean so i went with discussions because i was just like this is easier i get a little bit more out of it like i think it enhanced my experience it was more selfish i think than anything mm -hmm. um but that memory of ice review was one of the hardest videos I've ever had to make for sure. Cause you're like, am I getting all these details, right? What is happening? And it's, I don't have a lot of experience with this, but I think there are some people who can be intense about missed information. Sometimes. You think so. just a little bit. <laughs> They're passionate. People are very passionate about a, certain things. You it's a beautiful wanna... way to say asshole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Muck it up. <laughs> <laughs> but I do I don't ever write notes but when I was reading Gardens of the Moon there were parts there were things that I would read and I would think of something I was like this is really <laughs> because I sound like an asshole this whole stream this is a really interesting thought you're having Sarah this will be good to put in your review this will be great people will love it and then I got to the end of the book and I was like I don't remember anything <laughs> that I wanted to say yep. about this so I think I will write notes for the first time reading this series. I, um, I, I stopped, uh, relying on my brain. I write notes. I, I have to, it's just easier. It does suck. Sometimes when you get a break and write. Um, it's not a great feeling. Like sometimes it really kills my momentum, but I got to do it if I know I'm going to review it. And I do know if I haven't written the note by like page 100 of a book, most of the times it means I'm not going to review it. Right. Uh, like Dresden, I haven't written a damn note in books because, and it's not because like, I'm not enjoying it. I'm just, having fun like i'm just leisurely reading it um and i don't feel like i have anything to say so i'm just like i'm just gonna read these and consume i'm really them. sad because i really love doing the reading vlogs for dresden because there's so much fun stuff to react to like mm -hmm. it's a book where there's gonna be like wild hmm. things happening and like a lot of emotional stakes if you're invested in the characters yeah and there's no other series that I have found thus far that I could do that for. And I really, really like doing it for Dresden. But I feel like it has to be something that you're super into. And that yes. also enough people have read so that they can watch them. Because they have to be spoilery just by, by nature. But it just doesn't fit more serious books, I don't think. Like, I, I, I you know, people yeah. love Realm of the Elderlings. But I couldn't see myself doing those for the realm of the elderlings because it would just be a video of me crying be like this really horrible thing happened yeah i think i think it's a little bit more reflective than reactionary i yes, would say exactly yeah. i think that makes sense i think red rising is a good vlog series that's true, that's true. there's so much shit that happens in those books um a song of ice and fire also would be a great vlog um, mm -hmm. especially i would watch that if someone vlogged the and they were totally blind without the show which is so rare now um, but if someone had not, never seen the show and was just reading through the first time, I would watch that immediately. Absolutely. Do you have any advice for uh, for Alan how he could get to 10K? Because like he's been trying so hard to catch up to me. Um, Be nicer to people <laughs> and just in general. And tell the truth about books, specifically Dreamcatcher. <laughs> Integrity and kindness. <laughs> Not a not a lick of integrity uh, with that one. No, I, Alan, I would say maybe do that here of ages review. You said it's forty five minutes. I mean, the biggest fandom on BookTube is Cosmere, and you were sitting on a Cosmere review that apparently is full of hot takes. Now it might garner a lot of negative comments. 
release the hounds. Mm -hmm. I want to see it. I want to know. Read books people like. That <sighs> is usually a good way to gain followers. That's not a bad idea. Not a bad idea. I would also just love to see Alan finally read Jade Legacy at some point. True. Like I'm clicking that immediately. Bell notification on. Uh, Mendelin says that your Dresden blogs are some of his favorite videos. They're really fun. They were extremely fun to film. <laughs> Alan is 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 shook. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Fit the Bureau says, I think Alan, it just means being more regular. People don't always subscribe when they watch YouTube. I can't imagine why someone watching Alan and not subscribing serious. Yeah. It, it, all joking aside, I think Alan is like the goat. Like, I, yeah. I don't understand why he doesn't have a million people watching him. I think uh, that probably is like, I think your, your videos are going to be recommended on the dash or whatever more often if you're posting frequently. And unfortunately, if you have a lot in your life and you're passionate about your job and you donate lots of your time to helping young people succeed, you don't have as much time to post YouTube videos. Yeah. But on the, on the flip side of that, you know, outside of our sphere, uh, I know you YouTubers only post like every two months and they just post a video and they have millions of subscribers. That's fair. So. That's fair. But I do think you get more age, like you get a little more leniency with that whenever you're bigger. Um, yes. for sure. Once you reach a certain point, I think it just becomes like it, it builds on itself. But... Yes. It insists on itself, Lois. And Alan. sometimes you just hit a gold mine. Like you get people who deserved to always have this many subscribers like Bookborn. Her channel is great. Her videos are thoughtful. She's articulate and smart. And she really hit her stride when she did those Wheel of Time videos yeah. because it brought in the audience. But then people stuck around because her channel is great. But sometimes you just have to hit that topic that brings people in and then they will stay and that would happen with alan like people would stay if there was you know a big influx of people i can't imagine them yeah, leaving. i think it's a matter of time especially with the history videos uh yeah. it, it it will happen at some point for sure and then you know me and you sarah we'll just be sit still be sitting here you know saying how we don't care about bad endings and it's okay it's just okay. reviewing books and alan will be a famous history book tuber <laughs> or a youtuber at that point i guess I am articulate and smart too, Sarah. You are. See, even when I'm trying to say nice things about Alan, it never works. I'm just going to continue to say my mean things because that's all he hears. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Well, this has been absolutely phenomenal, Sarah. I uh, I, I got to thank you for coming on. And uh, someone did out me. They said you picked a Canadian to do the day after Thanksgiving because you knew that they would not have, um, you know, post celebratory plans. True, and they, they were right. I, I reached for the Canadian that I know and love the most. Uh, and that is my Newfoundland friend, Sarah. So, hey, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. <laughs> it was an absolute pleasure. Alan, thanks for co-hosting from the chat. Um <laughs> I'm thinking about maybe a segment where I bring Alan on, but I also bring on his enemies. So you're going to have to be on speed dial for that. Please um, do. As we know, Alan has a holy war against you for whatever reason. No reason. I think people have learned tonight that there's no reason because I read everything he tells me to and I enjoy it. <laughs> and uh, also sorry to all the other Canadian booktubers that I love, but Sarah is the best. So <laughs> you, you just have to deal with it. What, what do we have to look, uh, to look forward to uh, closing out the year on your channel? What, what, what can we get hyped up about? I am putting together a series of essential classic and foundational and modern fantasy to read. So for people who want to know what they should read from each of those three eras. And then just like a bunch of the end of the year stuff. I do have a hopefully end of the year live stream in the works where I'm going to meet up with someone and chat about our favorite things and what we loved. And outside of the like typical top 10, just, you know, more nice. about various things from from the year. Wonderful. I, I look forward to all of that and that'll be a lot of fun. And uh, yeah, I better get start work on my top 10 video. God, go. I can't believe it. it it's going to be wild. Winner. Hey, next time you don't have to wait seven months. I'll have you back in sooner. I promise. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Sarah. Thank you chat for being here. I hope if you're in the United States that you had a good Thanksgiving and, uh, and anyone prepping for the holidays, remember just slow down, take it all in and uh, appreciate it. So Sarah, thank you again, chat. Thank you. And until I see you next time, be good, be safe. Go su subscribe to Sarah's channel. And remember to always keep turning the page.